What's up, Moral Combat fans? Hi, Moral Combat fans. Thanks my for being here. Thanks for being here. My name is Zach. And my name is Nathan Blostone Faust. Wow. No, it's not official yet. Well, but, Thursday it'll be official. But I signed the paperwork. Yeah, it's true. I'm getting married in a week. Yeah. I'm eloping. We'll just we'll just blow past that. Yeah. Like we can, it's not that we big We can of talk a deal. about that on our other podcast. Yeah, 100 percent Uh, Because this podcast, we specifically like to talk about religious trauma. Yes, especially trauma from coming out of the Calvary Chapel Christian. Yeah, I was about to say, why do we talk about religious trauma? Why is that like our specific focus, Zach? Well, our father is a pastor, and we were raised heavily uh, soaked in the Christian Calvary Chapel evangelical. Like a a dank rag. (laughs) Yeah, uh, dipped in the gospel of Jesus Christ. But not anymore, as we have walked away from uh, this faith. Mine was like, what, 15, yeah. 20 years ago? Yeah, something like that. No, it was like 17 years ago, 16. You about maybe, I don't know, five? Uh, a month ago. Yeah, you're just getting started. <laughs> Scary out here. Uh, we're trying to be funny. Um, should we just go for we're it? We're being funny because we're nervous right now yeah. because uh, we are so happy to um, have our second guest ever in studio with us. Um... She goes all the way back to our childhood. So when we talk about childhood trauma, religious trauma, this individual was right there by our side. Um, Close relationships with our parents. We have very close relationship with theirs Mm -hmm. um, and their family. Or we did when we were like really, really young. In it. And so we've been planning this interview with, uh, let's give a round of applause to uh, Julia Myers. Indeed. Thank you. Thank you for being here. And also known um, from our past, we knew you as Julia Ortelli. Indeed. The Ortelli was a very famous last name. Sure was. <laughs> thanks for being here. Yeah, thank, thank you. you for being here so oh, much. Oh, man. Thanks for having me. It's been really exciting and slightly anxiety inducing, oh, right? Totally. Leading yeah, up to yeah, I'm like, yeah. oh my God, this is such a big deal. I didn't, yeah, I slept like four hours. And we've been doing this now for like almost two years. And, uh, What's been so unique about having you on our show was I know that we started talking about this, I don't know, maybe like last November or something. And you found us and then you sent us, you DM'd us through TikTok. Yeah. Which if you're listening, you can definitely stop and watch this on YouTube or TikTok or Instagram, you know, because we are a visual podcast, mm-hmm. video cast here. Um, and when your name popped up, I got this feeling where I was like, oh, no, wait, what's happening? It's actually happening. Because <laughs> we've been doing it for so long, just talking and the memories that I have with you and your family uh, are like, which I know because we talked a little bit already that you have this similar is there's real trauma like within our families just from the church and our past. So I have been hella nervous about this, but like in a really good way. And I feel like a lot of what Zach and I have been building up to is by putting the pressure on by doing the really scary things. So you being here in studio, I have so much gratitude. I'm extremely thankful. Um, and uh, I know you're doing a lot in your life around this. Uh, trauma healing and whatnot. So thank you for being here. Yes, thank you so much. Zachary, do you remember the Ortelli family? Of course I remember the Ortelli family. Because you're like really young. I mean, really, you were really, young too. We were all young. Like I'm only young. two years younger, dude. Oh, that's right. Okay, yeah. sorry. But no, I totally I totally remember you guys. Uh, I remember your younger, youngest sister the most. Uh, but no, everyone in your family. You yeah. had a lot, a lot of siblings. I sure did. And actually the second to youngest, right? Because the youngest, youngest was like a baby baby. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah exactly. So. We don't like to name drop anybody on this cast. We edit all the names out. But yeah. what we do like to name drop are the churches. Yes. And so Calvary Chapel Petaluma is yep. where we all come from, yep. uh, which is in the county that we filmed this podcast in. So come and get us. We're not afraid. Sure. Sure, if you guys want. I mean, it's a waste of time, but come get us. Uh, so we were under the same pastor, same youth pastors. Our father was your youth pastor, right? One of them. One of them. Yeah. Um, For a little bit, transitioned over to a few others, you know, but still. Yeah. Yeah. But you don't live in this county anymore, right? You guys... I don't. I live in Contra Costa County now. I live in Concord, so in the East Bay. Yeah. Yes. Get the hell out of here. Is <laughs> it? And I know you have friends here and you're seeing some oh. friends now that you're in town being here for our podcast, but... Is it weird driving into Sonoma County? Uh, no, I've, even since I moved away, so my family and I moved away in um, 2017. We moved across the country to the East Coast to be near my uh, husband's family while my mother-in-law was going through chemo and radiation treatment. Mm -hmm. And we were there for one year. And then we moved to Pasadena after that year. We were there for three years and then moved up here two and a half years ago to Concord. And ever since being back, and even when we moved, like I would come back and visit and come back and, you know, visit family when my family was here. 
They all, except for one sibling, moved to Texas, and so they're all living there now. Kind of classic. And um, <laughs> and uh, so, but even since then, I still would, even from Pasadena, like I'd come up and visit friends and family because it's always been my home. And even though it held a lot of trauma mm. for me, it still was my home, and I never wanted to let that trauma take my home away from me. Totally. Interesting. Um, yeah. And I just I love Petaluma. I love Sonoma County, and I never wanted my pain to take that away from me. Um, And so I've always loved coming back. And I was, you know, mentioning earlier that I drove up once a week uh, last year in spring semester for an in-person class. And so during that time, I got to spend time with family or I'm with friends. And uh, it was really nice to be able to just be back in the area and see all the places that I loved and visit people that I love. So I always love coming. And whenever I do, I just try to maximize it. Like, who can I see while I'm here while I'm in town? Like, I'll text some friends and be like, hey, this time I want to see this person, this person. So there's never enough time. And it's like just far enough that you have to really plan it. Yeah. But like not quite close enough that you just like, yeah, just trek over. It's a trip. Yeah. It's an hour and 15, hour 20. But it's good. Yeah. Do you have any friends that uh, you still connect with that are still in the church at all? At least like Calvary Chapel? Um, in Calvary Chapel, I have a few that still are part of it. Um, are I would say I would still very much consider them my friends, but we don't really communicate a mm-hmm. whole lot like on the regular. Mm-hmm. Um, I have a lot yeah. of friends who've left and yeah. that were really well connected. Um, and especially since I've gotten a little bit more vocal about my story, which has been really scary. Um, as you guys know, uh, oh, yes. there's been more people that have kind of slid into the DMs like, oh my God, I know you. Do you yeah. remember? I'm like, oh yeah, I remember you. <laughs> yeah. And um, which has been like really <laughs> cool. Um, thankfully, aside from some family pushback, I haven't really gotten many people um, in the church who've like approached me and been like, you can't talk about yeah. this. How dare you? It, it could still happen, right? It's, yeah. it's, it's okay. always a possibility. Yeah. Um, but I just think in the you know last 15 years since I left, it's like 15 years. So how old are you now? I'm 36. Which I know we're not supposed to ask people their age, but... I'm 36. Yeah, so you're three years older than me, mm -hmm. and I was closer to your, not youngest sister, but your... Yeah, uh, the one right younger than me. The middle middle. Yeah. Yeah. Um, And uh, and I was, you know, same age as your sister, so I spent a ton of time at your guys' house, like your sister all the time. Last time, I think we mentioned it in text, last time we saw each other was my sister's wedding, Mm -hmm. and I was 15. Yeah, that was Mm -hmm. 2016 years ago. Seven or eight. Yeah. 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 It's, it's 2024. It's a long time. It is a, a long, long time. time. <laughs> yeah. Which, you know, yeah. a lot of people build a community in the church and meet each other in the church. And we're building, reconnecting as a community out of the church. Yeah. But, no, um, but it's beautiful. I love it. It is. Yeah. That's awesome. I'm, I'm like so happy to hear when I moved or about like your attachment not being so traumatic to this area or like you being able to like work through that. Because when I, I moved back here, when I found out about my son and I never thought I'd come back. And I like kicked and screamed against it. I was driving from San Francisco for like court dates. And uh, it took me like a year and a half when I did move back. I hated this area. Oh, my God. But I was still going to church to support my parents when I moved back. because I was like so depressed and anxious about having this new kid. And like so Go, I just, going like, to church, as, not like every Sunday. He was going to church like when you had your yeah, son. Because I felt bad. I yeah. wanted him to be part yeah. of his grandparents. It was you a know? family thing. Yeah. 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 Then I worked through all of that and realized like, God damn, this church just gets you in every way. Like even when you like detach for a decade, you can still have these layers, right? That And so moving back here for me was like when there was a lot of trauma that mm-hmm. I started to feel that I just drank myself to pieces. I mean, I was working my ass off in the hospital as a nurse, but I was drinking and partying and all of that. Well, we were also DJs, different lifestyle at that point too. Yeah, that was fun. Remember that? That was, it was so much more fun than this. That wasn't religious trauma. <laughs> <laughs> so then, um, yeah, welcome back to the county that uh, we were all raised in. And um, hopefully it's not as traumatic here. Yeah, no. Hopefully it'll it make no. it feel a little no. home-like. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I think it's like, I have a, when I was saying, saying earlier that when you first DM'd us, which I think is funny, we're redefining the DM. Mm-hmm. You know, like when people have like come out of the church and they're DMing you like, yo, yeah. I'm not a Christian either. Yeah. Is this chill? You're like, dude, let's hang <laughs> yeah, out. Right? Come, yeah. come on my show. Totally. Yeah. It's not the DM like, uh, we need to take go out to coffee. Yeah. Did you come yeah. out to coffee with me? No, like, yeah, it's oh my different. God. <laughs> yeah, oh, come on camera coffee. with us. Tell us your story. Let's go meet at a coffee shop. Just that alone. I'm like, oh. Well, let's jump into Jared. it. Um, and let's just start with some like basics. Okay. Mm -hmm. So I, and I really cannot remember, I was so young. So I just, we were born into the Christianity evangelical faith, right? It was like, and it wasn't Calvary Chapel when we were 
like being like young or whatever. It was in Napa and it was, I think it was like, Wasn't that Calvary Chapel? Was it Calvary Chapel? I think it's always been it's Calvary Chapel. It's always been Chapel. Calvary Chapel. That makes sense. Because they came from Costa Mesa. Yeah. No, you're right. Sorry. Chuck Smith, that's, man. That's he the got them all. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, so the way I always feel about this is it was like, I don't really know anything else besides being born in it and then being born out of it. <laughs> and so, born again out of it. Born again out yeah. of it. Um, was that the same for you? Were you, is your family Christian when you were born or was it something that happened later? Um, when I was born, my family was Catholic. So they went to a Catholic church and my, both my parents were pseudo raised in a Catholic church. My mom's family a little bit more so like re- religiously, <laughs> um, I would go, you know, be involved. And, in, um, my grandma, my mom's mom was very involved and devout. And they, when my parents got married and started having kids, uh, they, took us to Catholic church. We went to Catholic school for a couple of years. Mm. And then they were a part of Amway, the MLM yeah. Amway. Mm, still yeah. a thing now. That. Still yeah. a thing now. It what really is, that? is It's a multi-level marketing. Oh, okay. Yeah. Pyramid scheme, you know? Totally. Love it. <laughs> um, <laughs> Classic. Yes. And uh, they were involved in that. And at one of the conferences, if I'm remembering this correctly, at one of the conferences, they got they got saved, like Oof. a Christian got saved. Oof. And then they came back, left the Catholic church, pulled us from the Catholic school and um, started looking at Christian churches. We went to one here in Santa Rosa for a little bit. Um, there was like a four square church just because we had some friends who went to it. Ben actually went to a Nazarene church in Petaluma for a couple of years and then Calvary Chapel. And it was Calvary Chapel when it was Suzanne's dance studio old building mm. on Petaluma Boulevard. Oh, I totally know. And yeah. Jay Stapleton. That, like, you know, the that whole, white building. Uh-huh, white building. <laughs> we painted that yeah. to go to camp. Remember? Remember do you remember? I do remember that. Like, that's yeah. how we paid for camp. I remember Child, that now. Childhood slave labor, it's dog. The best. <laughs> 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 we'll pay for you to go to camp, but how about you paint this yeah. whole building? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Um, so I remember being like nine, 10 years old out there with like brushes oh painting that building. Um, so yeah, that's where we were then. And so that's really, even though I was baptized Catholic, I had my first communion experience in second grade in a Catholic church. But pretty soon after that was when they m- moved us into a uh, you know, Christian space. And so then um, we started going to Calvary. I think I was nine. Um, and that's when that that's started. That's when it all began. That's when that all started. Um, wow. Yeah. But I mean, I had an experience, I think, a couple years before that at the Four Square Church. I was actually just talking to my husband about this last night. I'm at the Four Square Church, and it was my very first experience with asking Jesus in my heart and becoming mm. saved. And this church is in general, you know, four square churches are very uh, exuberant and uh, intense. Yeah. Um, lots of speaking in tongues and really intense dancing mm. and music and all the things. I was pretty freaked out to yeah. be Super there. Scary. You know, They bring you into Sunday school and um, they had these cubbies, you know, those cubbies where it's like a kind of tall yep. and then it has hooks and then that uh, section in the top for like your lunchbox yeah, or whatever. Yeah, yeah. So they had that wall of those and then a little table and coloring and, Sunday school teacher. And I remember I'm a very extroverted person and I have been since I was a kid. It drove my family crazy because I just talked to everybody yeah. all the time. Um, but I was so freaked out to be there and I was really nervous. So I sat my body in one of those little cubbies so I could like face the table. But the lady kept, would say to me like, Julia, are you okay? Like, do you want to come sit? I'm like, no. And I just like the pressure on my shoulders, the being in this little box, like made me feel a little more safe because yeah. I was very like unsure but I'll never forget her message was talking about Jesus and talking about how we're all born. This was the first time I heard this message, not the last, we know. Yeah. <laughs> we're all born sinners. And so from birth, we are born evil sinners who God cannot look at us with love because we're covered in sin. Oof. And only because Jesus died and Jesus' blood washed over us cleaned off the sin that then God can look at us and say, I love you. Now I can see you and I love you. And I remember sitting in this cubby and I, like, I'll just never forget the physical feeling of my body being kind of squished in there and anxious and then being like, oh my God, God hates me. Cause like, I didn't Damn. say I'm sorry. Then you're and, seven. Yeah. I was like seven years old and six, maybe even six, six, seven, somewhere around there. And I just remember looking, this lady was so intense and she was like, you need to ask Jesus into your heart so you can be forgiven so that God can love you. Because unless you do that, like God cannot look at you with love. And instead he detests those things that yeah. aren't purified Ugh. by the blood of Jesus. I was like, well, I don't want to be detested. I, I'm good. Like I, I'm pretty good. Like yeah. I think I'm a good person. And I think I'm like a caring person. And like, I love 
animals and people. And like, I was a good kid. Yeah. And so I'm like, okay, this is what I have to do. I'll pray. So she led everybody through the sinner's prayer. You know, we all prayed. And I remember going back out, just feeling so disoriented, like, did the blood get everything off? Mm. I remember having that feeling of like, did, did the blood, like, did it work? It, it, can God see me now? Does God love me now? And I remember every opportunity from there all the way through probably high school, every altar call opportunity. I took it. No yeah. way. Honest to God, I took it because I was like, what if it didn't take, what if it oh. didn't take off everything? What if- Like every time if, they'd be like, if anyone wants to give their life to I, I Christ. Would no I would do way. it every time. Wow. And like, not necessarily, at one point I was like, I need to stop raising my hand because yeah. like someone's going to be like, Julia, yeah. now Julia, yeah. you're yeah. Yeah. You're a scammer. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> like, um, is there something wrong? But like in my heart, I'd be like, okay, God, I, I do it again. Because like, what if it didn't, what if? What if yeah. God didn't see that time? And- that continued, right, to be a message that we heard in mm. our, you know, upbringing in Calvary Chapel, where it was, you know, you're born a sinner, you're born inherently sinful, and you need Jesus, you need God to, you know, forgive you right from birth, uh, which is just such a messed up message to tell a yeah, developing child. It's abusive. It's so abusive. And, you know, as I um as I've been, you know, pursuing my degree in psychology, as I've gone through therapy for the last five years, mm -hmm. uh just learning about the development of children yeah. and how abusive this message is because it immediately puts them in a place where they have no other option mm -hmm. but to succumb to like the control that is then put on them after that, right? Mm -hmm. And I think that um, you guys talked about this on one of your previous podcasts where it's choosing to say yes to Jesus when the alternative is hell yeah. and eternal damnation, that's not an actual choice. Mm -mm. You can't actually make a sound choice mm -hmm. under the state of duress. That is a threat mm -hmm. and it's manipulative inherent. Like it just is. You, you can't say, hey, uh, you know, Nathan, pass me that thing. And if you don't, I'm going to punch you in the face. And you're like, okay, I'll pass you yeah, this yeah, thing. But exactly. this is mine. Like yeah, I don't want to yeah. give it to you. It's like, yeah. that's a threat, Survival. right? It is. And so as a young child, you go, if I don't do this, I'm literally going to go burn in a lake of fire yeah. forever and ever and ever. Okay, I'll say yes, you yeah. know? And so time after time after time, and I'll never, like, moments that kind of are cemented in there with that are things like heaven's gates and hell's flames, right? Those super yeah. messed up evangelical plays where it'd be like actual, like, Broadway level oh, yeah. theatrics of like burning fire and the whole place would get hot and yeah. the devil would come out and grab the kid from the rubble yeah, of the it'd car be a accident. Kid going to hell. Yeah, oh or, or it'd be the kid that, asked Jesus into their heart youth group last night and their mom would be dragged yeah. off. And I remember that one where it was like the mom was dragged off and the girl was begging Jesus, like, why are they taking my mom to hell? And oh, she didn't God. know me. And I, I remember just looking, being like, yeah, dude. This is like, it's just, it's so abusive and it's it so is. toxic. It's and so creepy. It really is. It's so it, creepy. It's but so there's creepy. all these adults standing around us, oh, no, right? Yeah. And it's just like, yeah, I'm being moved by this emotional yeah. experience. And by being like, yeah, that's why you need to ask Jesus into your heart. It's why you need to believe. And I'm like, now I'm like, that is just so messed up. I don't lot. know if we're allowed to swear on this podcast. You can, oh, yeah. you can swear. Like, yeah, you, can say, you can say anything sometimes, you fucking want. There's sometimes there's just no other words for no, it, right? Sure. It's now, so yeah. fucked up. It like is. it is, it's, and I have children now, they're six, nine and 11. And I look at them at these ages and I think to myself, I would never, ever, ever, yeah, ever, I know, right? ever let them hear a message your like six -year -old, that. Old, My like six year old, coddling son. up into a cubby just to be feel safe. And the way that yeah. he would have to regulate his feelings if somebody looked at him, like my my six year old is so sensitive and sweet. If I looked at him in the eyes and been like, the only way yeah. that I could love you is if we sacrificed our dog and like her blood. Like I'm thinking, like just how messed yeah. up if you put it into slightly different context yeah. that he'd be like. Not you know, oh, oh, yeah, it's no, so it's sad. Having it's so sad. Having kids really, it's like the old tale is old of time. Is like your parents, our parents are always like, "You'll know when you have your own kids," and it's like, "Damn right, I'll know yeah. when I have my own kids." I would like, never. I'm, I learned so much when my son came into my life, where I was like, "Oh, I will never pressure you." Given he's been pressured, and he back when he was like ten years old, or maybe it was the last year, like eleven. You know, he's at the age where his other family, his mom, are very religious and Christian, evangelical. And he told me, he was like, dad, you should know that I do think you're going to maybe burn in hell. He didn't say maybe, right? He said, yeah, you're going to burn, you're in, gonna hell. burn in hell. And I was like, and he was like, but this way he said, he was like, that's why we have to have a good relationship in this life. Mm -hmm. And when he said that, I like started to tear oh. up in the car, but I was like, I got so angry. And mm -hmm. I remember I wanted to so badly be like, how dare you do? Don't go down that path. And I just kept thinking of my dad being like, oh, that's what my dad did. My dad like 
would get angry at me. Like, so I was like, I got to let him. That's the whole point here. Right. I just never could have imagined it would be in like a similar weird reverse. Yeah. Um, but he's growing up a lot and like he's, you know, like he has something outside of that. Like, it's so amazing that your kids have you because we didn't have us. We've had to become our own parents mm-hmm. and our healing, right? Oh my gosh. Yes. It's yeah. insane. <laughs> and still today. Oh yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, the reparenting experience, man, I could, I feel like I could write an entire book and it still not be enough mm. of the way in which I have grown in that becoming a parent, you know, especially as a female growing up in that context in that church. Cause my, well, my family was very much in Calvary Chapel deep, right? We were at everything. We set everything every up. Camp, down. We were you, every you camp. Got, we were every camp. Dad was the bus worship. driver. Yeah, my dad was a deacon. Oh my God, like, your dad like, was the bus driver. Sorry. He was Sorry. the bus driver. Because he was a firefighter. Yeah, yeah he yeah, was. Yeah. A lot of yeah, firefighters I know. in the church. And, um, you know, we were just like, we were like a core, you know, like a backbone of that place. Like we helped run that place, you know. Um, and yay, child labor. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you know, like, seriously. You're, you're, we're telling you are going to lead worship again, again, again but, for every service. And I'm like, yeah, I'll ride, ride my bike to the yeah. this one place. I, I'm not going to say their name, but this one family would host like morning devotions at like 6 a.m. And you guys, I would ride my bike down these dangerous, windy roads in the country in Petaluma, holding my guitar sometimes on wow. a bicycle in the to fog. To go lead worship? To go lead worship at 6 a.m. Wow. You were a perfect Christian. Wow. You were a perfect Christian. When people say like, you know, things when you leave the church, they're like, you know, Oh, you were never really. You just were never really committed to begin with. I'm like, oh, don't even. I I have receipts. Yeah, bro, you don't even know. I have receipts. You don't even know, bro. How like, oh, you didn't um, love God. I'm like, I love God way more than any of you. I love God more than anything in the <laughs> yeah. world. Yeah, I was like, so scared not to. You don't even know. You don't, <laughs> yeah. and they really don't even know. Like I've sat with my husband before and I've described to him some of the things and the thoughts that would go through my head and the way in which I let all of that, sh- you know, shape who I was and what I did and my behavior. That I would literally have like panic attacks if other people near me were doing things that I knew were bad. sinful and bad. Oh, but totally. a lot of those things were just like kind of normal experiences. Mm-hmm. And I would be so burdened and like overwhelmed by like, I can't even be adjacent to it. Yeah. That like I would, my body would literally freak yeah. out. Like it was in my blood. It wasn't just a like, oh, I believe in Jesus. Oh, just kidding. I don't like, yeah. it was everything to yeah. me. It was everything to me. Well, it's life or death. It, exactly. And then you're also told that this life is worthless. This life, like don't be in the world. Be like, or what is it? Yeah, be uh, in the world, but not, not, the world, not of, the world. of the world. Right. And so this whole present, be present. It's like, yeah. don't be present. No, right. wait until heaven. Right. Which is such a, uh, it's such an escape, um, mm-hmm. escapist mindset. If, if that makes sense, like totally. Totally. it's a, it's a way to escape the consequences of the actions that you take yeah. part in here yep. on earth, and like escaping the responsibility to do something about injustices yep. in the world, yep. right? Yeah. And even if those injustices are happening to people in your family, and so yep. like it's like, well, yeah. well, in this next life, we're all going to be, and it's like, wait, what? <laughs> yeah, no, like that's just you're just trying to like escape the consequences of actions by this like eternal thinking. It's like, well, how about the right here and right now in front of you? Cause yeah. we're right in front of each other, you know? Um, it's interesting. Yeah. Like you're saying like how so much of your childhood to teenage years were like, you were like scared. You could barely even literally psychologically handle somebody else just living a normal life next to you. That wasn't this perfect evangelical Christian life. And it's like the, this ultimate pyramid scheme that, you know, you it's like as, as a seven-year-old, they're like, if you don't give your life to Christ, you're going to burn in hell. And the only, and you were born already evil. So it's the fight or flight at seven years old. Yeah. And that's like, that's your first part, mm-hmm. right? That first part's mm-hmm. like, boom, you're seven-year-old scared yep. shitless. Yep. And that like rules so much, right? It's like, so yeah. like being next, that fear, like fear dominates your decisions. And I think that like, that's why... I, I don't know if, I don't think my parents have any relationship, I'm not trying to call them out, but like with anybody that's not a Christian, like their, their community is so only mm-hmm. that. But do you remember being told that? I remember being told, do not have friends who are non-Christians because they'll pull you away. Yeah. And it was it's like, slippery slope. To you. Yeah. yeah, slippery slope. <laughs> don't fall down the slippery <laughs> slope. Oh, dude, when I first went to school, uh, way late, like, uh, Seventh grade, I actually made friends. I remember feeling guilty for having friends that weren't Christians yeah. and having to tell mom and dad like multiple times, like I talked to them, they, 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 they said this and I'd feel so guilty just someone saying it around. Yeah. Me. So much guilt, so much shame. Yeah. yeah. When my family was very highly influenced also by um, movements like IBLP, the Bill Gothard. Um, What's it stand for? Uh, IBLP? Yes. Um, International Bible Leadership. Ugh. Program? 
Mm, I can't. I can't. I like, <laughs> I like it's, like an, it it's like a convention. Yeah. Oh, it's like a, so it's like a homeschool day, like ATI right. homeschool. Mm. Like you know, all the girls wear skirts and oh. blouses, and boys have to wear pants. It's very um, very complementarian. Very like men are at the top, mm. and you know, like women have to submit kind of thing. And sure. it's very, very ultra conservative, very fundamentalist, very intense. Uh, the quiverful movement, which is very adjacent to that, where it's like have as many kids as you can to build up the army of the Lord and to create uh, these like, like these. Cult. Like, uh, the quiver yeah, movement. It's, it's dude. called the quiverful movement. And legit, like I remember my parents having some books about it and um, uh, Mike and Debbie Pearl were a part of that and they are super problematic. I mean, they've mm. written books. They've actually had like a lot of legal stuff against them for for teaching and supporting active child abuse. Like mm. their their uh, methods were very abusive. And so my parents had books from them and, and James Dobson and fa- Focus on the Family. Like they had a lot mm. of influences that they really clung to along with the Calvary Chapel um, movement. Which we and all did. Yeah, totally. But so we were home, we were pulled from school then. After we left Catholic school, we went to a, a private Christian school for one year and then they started homeschooling us. Yeah, and you were homeschooled how long? I was homeschooled from fifth all the way to 12th grade. Yeah. Uh, through, so through high school. So through high school, I begged and pleaded daily in middle public. school and high school to go public school. And you know how involved like I was in youth group. Like yeah. we were literally, our family was there Sunday morning, Sunday night, you know, Tuesday morning, Thursday morning devotions, most weeks at the, you know, at 6 a.m., um, a couple of us as teenagers, and then Wednesday night, then Friday night. And then if there were programming on Sunday or Saturday, you know, we were just, we read everything. Yeah. Um, and so that was kind of our social world then. Like our, we uh, kind of existed in this bubble. It was like our family and then the Calvary Chapel family. And we could go to school campuses for their Jesus clubs, where that was like yeah. a ministry, ev- like evangelism opportunity yeah. for us. So that's why we were allowed to go on campuses once club, or twice a week for yeah. the Jesus club. And that's it. Yeah. Um, and I would beg my parents, like, please just let me go to school. Like all my friends from youth group, they're going to school. And like, it's not bad. Like, it's good. It's fine. And I was really insecure because even though I was being homeschooled, my homeschool education was not an adequate education. Oh, most isn't. And yeah. Most isn't. And you and, were and, aware of that? Oh, I was aware. I guess you, because oh, you're all the way through high school. So you I were I was like, very aware of it because there would be friends of mine that would talk about their homework or I'd be at their house having a sleepover and they're like, I do my homework and they'd be doing stuff and I'd look at it and be like, I have no idea what the hell yeah, that yeah, is. I had yeah. one paper a month. Like, I mean, and we, you know, my mom, <laughs> not she, even. like they would, you know, they would write us like, okay, we have these lesson plans. There was a lot of good intentions a lot of the time, but then life, you know, I was one of seven kids and it's like, how do you how do you homeschool seven kids at the caliber that you would need to to match like a yeah. normal education track, you know? So I have a lot of, as I've grown and as I've gone through a lot of healing, like I have a lot of compassion for my parents in that they were trying their best a lot of times, but very heavily misguided by like what they should be doing. There was so much fear that yeah. influenced that decision. So it wasn't, we think this is academically best for our kids. It was like, there's so much fear of our kids being out in the world they're going to be tainted and they're going to be influenced. So we need to keep them home and safe and in this bubble. Yeah. But what that did then instead was, we. I, I'll only speak from my own experience. Okay. When I graduated high school, I had, I ended up doing a, like a search online for like academic uh, levels of like things you should know by the time you graduate high school. And I found this little survey wow. thing and this list of like, by the time you graduate high school, you should be proficient in this list. Yeah, da, 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 da. I remember reading it and the level that I was at was at a ninth grade level. No, when yeah. I, but I graduated high school. I passed the tests because I studied for them and I was like, okay, but I have no idea what these things mean. Mm. I didn't take geometry. I didn't take, um, I took one algebra class at the junior college. I convinced my parents to let me go there because I wasn't getting education at home. And we had like this video algebra thing, but we routines. We didn't watch it if we didn't yeah, have to. Totally. We'd be like, oh, I'll watch it when we have to. Yeah. Um, you tell a 15-year-old to go do our algebra homework and she's like, okay. Yeah, but, right. But, you know, so there was really not as much strong oversight to make sure I was meeting those milestones. So when I graduated high school, I thought, well, I can't go to a regular college. So they're going to find out I don't know anything. Yeah. Not to mention, as a female growing up in that space, the emphasis was so high on your, your role is to get married and have yeah. babies. So it's okay. And I remember there being times where my mom would say, like, it's okay. Like you don't need a degree in order to do, you know, what you're called to do, which is to get married and have babies. But I remember being like, but I'm really good at things and I'm, I'm really smart. I'm capable of mm-hmm. learning more, but like, I'm not given the opportunity, you know? So I walked, I ended up going to the Calvary Chapel Bible college because mm-hmm. like, well, I could study the Bible. Cause if anything, that's where I can like folk, I know so much about it already. And I've been immersed in this, like, at least that's like a noble 
thing to seek out, right? I'll be studying theology and I'll be favorable to God. I was all about like staying pure and being on God's good side, right? Mm. And like keeping my sure. intentions good and being the good Christian girl. Um, and so I went and I went to one semester at the Calvary Chapel Bible College in Maui. And then I came home and worked for a little bit and went to the Murrieta uh, main campus. Mm. And that's where, funny enough, that's where my like leaving the church began was at Calvary Chapel, wow. Marietta Bible College. Wow. What, yeah. made, what, what pushed you in that direction? So it's really interesting, but I was there and I just remember, so my, my intuition has always been very strong. I am as a, as some would describe as an empath. Like I feel feelings really deeply. Like, uh, and cheers. Same 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 same. It's wonderful and terrible at the same yes, time, right? Exactly. Um, sometimes it's a blessing, sometimes it's a curse. It's both, and yeah. I remember as a kid being told by family members and siblings, all you're just too sensitive. And I'd be like, I can't help it. Yeah. Like I walk into a room and I feel people's feelings. Totally. Like, and I just, but I always would have this feeling inside of me when it would be things like altar calls or some of these messages about like, you know, you're not good. And, you know, I heard in my own home, like, Julia, if I let you be who you are, you would be a terrible, horrible person. Oh, God. And I can't let that happen. Who would, so instead, who would say that I, to you? I, you know, people, it, yeah. People. So I just, family. you know, family, important members of yeah, my family. family. And I remember just being so crushed by that because those, again, were de developmentally important, yeah. critical years were then who I was learning about who I was. And my intuition was like, no, it's not true. Like I'm good yeah. and I, I care and like, I'm not bad. And, and like, you know, sure. Do I make mistakes and do I mess up and do I get angry and do I, you know, whatever. Yeah. But like, I'm a good person mm. and I was doing everything I could to be good. And I'm thinking, I can't even try any harder to be any yeah, better. Yeah. But like, it, you're telling me that like who I am at my core, like that part of me, like is, it would be terrible and horrible. And it just messed with me so much. And so I always had though this really strong intuition that would tell me all the time, like, that's not true. And it's not true. And I'd be sitting in youth group and there'd be messages about, you know, hell and God's going to deny you if you deny him and all these things. And be like, okay, but if God is who you say that they are, then like, that can't be true. Yeah. Like, it just can't be true. Yeah. Right. So I went to Bible college for the second semester and I remember just Going there, they had so many rules. I mean, I this could be a whole other podcast <laughs> um, because it's so many rules and so many things. I was like, this is really intense. Like Maui was pretty chill because I mean, I was going to say at least it's in Maui. It's, it's, at least it's in Maui, and like I think that they had, they they did adopt kind of a lot of that laxy laxadaisical yeah. like oh let me yeah. think goes. They had their very strict Calvary ways, but at least like you know we were all living in condos. It wasn't like a big main campus, and so there was a little bit more, even though there was some really rigid, intense things. It was even more intense on this compound of Calvary Chapel, Marietta. I don't know if you guys have ever been there. Oh, yeah, totally. Um, the Bible which College. Which Marietta is the home of Calvary Chapel, which is where like, not Marietta specifically, uh, right? Um, Costa Mesa it's is like the, the hub. home. And, and then Marietta was the um, Hot College. Springs property that they owned for the Bible College. They actually sold it two years ago, I think. Um, and moved to somewhere else. But uh, yeah, yeah. That is, they had like a retreat center it, there. It's basically like the ground zero mm -hmm. for Calvary Chapel. Mm -hmm. And you went to like the source yes. of education yes. and be like, this is how you become the powerful. I think that's yes. where our father graduated from. I don't think he ever grew. I don't know. I don't no, know if he, he did. But he, he did. went yeah. to the, he went, yeah, he was like yeah. taught under Chuck Smith. And But again, all you're doing there is learning, learning the Bible. You're oh, not and, but learning you're le school, but, right? Yeah, right, exactly. And yeah. you're learning it through Chuck Smith, essentially. Yeah. So we had to do these things where every week we had to listen to seven hours worth of what they called Chuck tracks, and they were Chuck Smiths. Chuck tracks from the beginning to end Chuck of the Bible. Tracks. They're they're called Chuck tracks. How is this <laughs> not looked at as a cult? Oh no no okay so this is where this is going. <laughs> yeah. it, 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 it is, is. Well, well, I mean, if okay. you're out of it, but they, okay. in it they're like not oh, a cult. No, in it they would deny to yeah. every degree. Like okay, it is fenced in with security gates coming in or out. Right? Oh God. There are in the security gate office. There's walls of students who are banned. <gasps> for speaking out against Calvary or for getting caught doing inappropriate things Dude, in wow. camp. Like there's literally a, a list of faces. That, we got to like, get hidden. Yeah, we got to get, we gotta gotta get, on we gotta get in there. We got to get in there. <laughs> oh man. I'm like, oh man, maybe my, maybe my picture's I up there. I bet you hope so. Uh, yeah. I get up there. It might, if it's not. It's a trophy no, of success. It might be now, what an accomplishment right? to yeah. get on the Marietta wall. Oh Seriously. my gosh. So, it was so intense and so regulated. They literally had like security people walking the perimeter of the school regularly. Yeah. And then they had curfews. So it'd be like, if you're not in your dorm at 12 PM, you will get written up. And then you have to show up at 6 AM the next morning to the Dean's office and explain why. 
Hmm. So I remember getting there and hearing all these crazy rigid rules. Those are only some of them. One of the really bogus was girls are not allowed to leave their dorm with wet hair because then boys will see you with your wet hair and know you just took a shower. Then they're going to think about you taking a shower and they will stumble. Oh, God. So, oh. so we couldn't leave this unless we had our hair blow dry. <laughs> real. Or in a braid or in a bun or like whatever. Like we could not have our hair and visibly so just, wet. Just to preference that so this doesn't feel like it's 100 years ago. How long ago was this? That was in, in 2007. Yeah, 2007. Yeah. Okay, okay. Yeah, that was in 2007. So um, I would be sitting in these uh, mess, you know, in these classes and my intuition would be saying things to me like, this is not, this is not how it should be. This is not how it is. I remember being in a hermeneutics class and the hermeneutics, teach, hermeneutics is like Thank the, you, um, <laughs> the, uh, from what I can remember a definite, like quick definition wise is like basically the, um, underneath like the de- like defining how the Bible's interpreted and like taking a scripture and breaking it down, like oh, God, into the yeah. hermeneutical understanding, like the Latin, the Greek, the, all the different languages that were used. Right. And then taking that scripture, then kind of deconstructing it. <laughs> um, and, like, <laughs> and, then, and then kind of like, you know, understanding what it actually means. So then sure. we can kind of put it back in and go scripture, by, you know, verse by verse, yeah. chapter yeah, yeah. by chapter. You can only do that if you break it down to that hermeneutical level, right? Yeah. That was probably the most technical class they offered at that at that um school. Sounds and a little so, bit like you might have learned a lot. I mean, you could have, but it was all through the lens of right. it's what all Calvary Chapel right? believed in, right? So they had all of us like write a little like sermon as part of one of our um, assignments. But what's ironic is that when like the girls had to get up and speak their part of the sermon only to the girls. But then when it was part, when it was time for the boys to read their sermon, they could read it to everyone. And I remember hearing the, the that teacher, his daughter preached preach this sermon like this, you know, it's like 15 minutes. And I remember being like, oh my God, like she's really good at this. Like oh, yeah. really good. Yeah, yeah. And oh, I'm yeah, sitting there yeah, thinking yeah. like, but she's only telling this to us. Like these are the girls, right? And I'm thinking this is a bummer because like she really understands this and she gets it and she's speaking it with such passion and such skill. And I remember thinking like, what a shame that like this is her father teaching this class and she's not even allowed to use her skill and her gift to its fullest capacity, oh right? Because women can't. So he, yeah. there was a very strong emphasis on, well, you guys are learning this and it's important for when you're leading women's Bible study or when you're teaching the children. So that's what I was going to ask is what's, and I'm only going to say this because I know the religion's purpose from being mm-hmm. in it. Mm-hmm. Why would a woman ever even go to this school? What's the it's point? To marry a pastor. So probably. it's just to marry a pastor and have yeah. more. It's like it's it's not, but it is. Like it is. So some some women really do want some sort of ministry position, right? Like they want to go be a missionary or they want to, be a children's ministry leader um, or a women's ministry leader, or they want to marry someone in ministry and then do ministry with them. Yeah, sure. So it's kind of a, and and some women, like some girls who I was in school with, they were like, four-year college was just not going to be fruitful for me if what I wanted to do was marry a missionary and have children and be in ministry. So that's what the intention would be for them. Do people take student loans out to go to this college? Um, Or is it like scholarship They might. It's actually, so this is a funny thing about it is it's, it was a retreat center, right? So that made the college a lot of money because people would pay to come and stay there and hear speakers and whatnot. And it was all of the retreat center was run by the students. So all the labor was done by the students. Yeah. Yard work. Um, me, I was on housekeeping. So every other weekend I put in 16 hours worth of oh my God. housekeeping, cleaning up rooms, like hotel rooms from people who would come and stay. So it was all run by the students. They didn't have like out of pocket expenses for this. So then they were able to keep tuition really low. Mm. So I believe it was like $3,500 a semester. Which so we paid that. I mean, it is, yeah. it is, but it's like, I paid that. And then I went and then I had to work 16 hours, either eight hours a week or 16 hours every other week. Um, and that was what I had to so do. you're painting churches as a kid. You're working for the church in college. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You're yeah. like, it's like hard labor to learn the manipulative belief. And then, right. Yeah. When it really never stops too, because if you become a pastor, I won't speak for every spouse of a pastor, every pastor's wife in the Calvary Chapel context, but for a lot of them, they end up doing free labor for the church yeah. as the pastor's oh, spouse, right? Yeah. So they're or not they're not on the payroll. They're not but it's children's just a, classes. Yeah, yeah, it's yeah. just assumed that they will yeah. take on those Women's roles. Studies. Yeah. So um that's kind of you so know So then it uh you go to this college, was it like you were wanting to do something in ministry or were you going to like, I want to marry a pastor? I did not want to marry <laughs> <laughs> I did not want to marry a pastor. And that was a big, it, it's ironic now, right? Because 
Okay, so (laughs) it's ironic because, spoiler alert, I'm married to a pastor. Yes. We were just talking about how pastors are really hard title sometimes because of what it holds for right. people like us who've been yeah. traumatized. It's a triggering word. It can be, yes. If you met my husband, he's the least triggering, least least threatening individual I've ever met in my life. I've never met someone who embodied the message and being of Jesus more than this person, than this man. Mm. And I can elaborate a little bit more about that later. I joked then, like his one flaw is that he's a pastor Yeah, because I I was so dead set. Like I will never marry a pastor. I will mm. marry someone who's like in the military or gone all the time. Which is just, basically the same. I mean, yeah, it's got his own <laughs> things, right? But like, I, I was thinking that because that would be a really hard life. Like yeah. I was thinking like, I, I would I would go through so many other hard things, but I will not marry a pastor because mm. I was just terrified of being stuck in this cycle. For good reason. Cycle. Yes, yeah. right. Yeah. And, and I just did not want it. So I would say that to some of my classmates and some of my, you know, college um, friends. And they were like, why would you say that, Julia? And it was like terrifying to hear a female say that, right? Yeah. Um, but I was in another class called Pastoral Epistles, which is like First and Second Timothy, First, Second, Third John, Titus, you know, these letters written from Paul and like to the churches and stuff. It was, supposedly written supposedly. from Paul. <laughs> so, it was, so it was very high emphasis on these are the ways in which to pastor. And so it was every class, the, pa- the pastor who led the class would say, this is for pastors and past future pastors' wives or current pastors' wives to know and understand this, but these messages are for pastors exclusively. Mm. So when it was talking about preaching the gospel and bringing these messages, there was one point where I raised my hand and I was like, what does this mean for me as a female reading the Bible? Why am mm. I exempt from this? And where does it say oh, that I'm... Step- oh, it was, it was one of my the first times like really stepping out to say like, mm, something doesn't seem right, but like my intuition was just dying. I was just like, every class, I'd be like, oh my gosh. And this was the class I had right before this one or right after. I kid you not, was a Proverbs 31 class where you literally learned to be a Proverbs 31. What was it? Cooking classes, etiquette, how to take care of like a husband. Like the whole class was just on the Proverbs class, 31. The entire class, only women could be in it. We literally oh, had God. to have we literally had to have demonstration days where we'd like meet at another pastor's wife's house and we'd all be in charge of like Chopping vegetables, preparing dinner, because this is what we'd have to do as a pastor's this wife is a or as a film. godly wife. This is like and a this great is, story and, for a and horror just, film. Just to reiterate, a, this is Calvary Chapel, yes. right? So this is, uh, can you say the school one more this time? This is Calvary Chapel, Marietta, Bible yeah. College, 2007. Uh, yeah, that's such a— Which we know they're just bigger now. 100%. And they're probably still and doing this exact thing. All yeah, all yeah. It's not just one over. school. Yeah. It's yeah. wild to think of how much of an impact Chuck Smith had— and the cult he actually created. Yes. Because well, he it's just so, made it to Hollywood. Too. It's so beyond Christianity. Christianity yeah. is just the religion, but right. then there's this culture, this yes. cult yes. of Calvary Chapel yes. that we're all from. Yes. I talk to other people that aren't part of Calvary Chapel and they'll, they'll be like, oh, I'm so sorry you went through that. Mm-hmm. And they still are Christians and they believe it yeah, all. And right. like, I'm like, how could you? And it blows yeah, my mind. Right. But it's Calvary Chapel. It's I wrote very a, specific. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I wrote a paper actually, funny enough, that was called The Cult of Calvary Chapel. And it nice. was a, this like multiple page paper all about the history of its origins and like red flags wow, that went up cool. real early. Um, that one is a, um, a feather rustler for sure. <laughs> uh, I don't know if it'll ever make it anywhere else, but it's, you know, I wrote it and I spent a lot of time. How like, healing. Yeah, it really was, honestly, yeah. to go that deep and to go back and be like, just writing Damn about this shit at all, yeah. right? Oh, totally. Like, totally. it's so powerful. It really has been. So in that, like, I remember the pastor of that class, back to that um, pastoral epistles class, and he said, this isn't for you. Like, it's just not for you. It's for pastors. And it's important for pastors' wives to know so that they know the way in which God is instructing their husbands or their pastors. Place. Yeah, and I was like, but I just can't believe, like, an entire section of the Bible would just be, like, I would be exempt from learning from it. It doesn't make sense to me. And he was like, well, it doesn't have to make sense to you. That's just what it is. Mm. And I remember Damn. sitting there just being like, okay. And he said, and he's like, so if you're a pastor's wife, it'll be important. I was like, but I don't want, and this was with like literally like pearl clasping, like girls going, <gasps> like, I was like, but I don't want to be a pastor's wife. So what does it mean for me? And that's when he responded that like, it doesn't have to make sense to you. This is just how so it is. So he's basically saying, fuck your critical thinking. Yes. Get in line. Yes. And shut up. Yes. And all the girls are looking at me like. Yeah. And they're making you feel, like, they're like, like crazy. heads like. What did she just say out loud? And I just sat there and was like, okay. So at the time I had a job at Starbucks down the street. I was doing 22 units of worth course, of school of and I was working 14 <laughs> hours, 14 to 18 hours at, at um, Starbucks. 
there were two girls. Uh, these girls literally saved my life and changed the trajectory of my entire life. I've never been able to find them to reconnect with them like since. And I one day I hope that I can. They, I got to be such good friends with them, working with them. And they very lovingly and gently, every shift would just kind of give me some pushback. They'd be like, yeah, we went there once and we left. And I remember at first being like, oh, Wait, they were like, they were, they went to the college as well Mm -hmm. and they, they they deconstructed. Uh And they left, but they they just like flat out left and they went like, they were like, we're done. I guess we're on the highway to hell. So we might as well have a great time. Like they didn't even, they, in there, at least at that time, they were not interested in deconstructing anything. That was, they were just like, bye. Like once they learned. Those first two years, it's all about testing the waters. And they were just out, out. And they were, but they were so loving and gentle. And they would see me and they go, Julie, like, we care about you so much. And you're such a wonderful person. Like we, ha- and like, it took probably a month and a half of us working together and of them like kind of just gently pushing back things. Like, have you ever asked about this? Or like, doesn't this not make sense? Yeah. And yeah. finally one day I was on shift with both of them. And they said, they're like, Julie, we really need you to know that you're in a cult. And I remember they said, they said it Powerful. and it, they were the very first people to ever yes. use that word. And I remember my first instinct, like just natural, like response was totally. to be like, oh my God, no way. <laughs> like, yeah, I'm not yeah, just like, who wouldn't? And as I was like going to respond that way, this little voice inside my intuition was like, they're right. That same voice. The same voice. And they were like, they're right. And you know it. Yeah. And I remember being like, so simultaneously, I'm like wanting to fight for this institution Culture. this that I've been a part of. It's like literally yeah, like since birth. I mean, it's it's in essentially, you. Yeah. yeah. So I'm like, I I wanted to fight, but then immediately it was like my soul felt this like relief. Like finally someone said it. Mm. And I remember just looking at them and sobbing. And they just held me in this Starbucks. Like wow. we're in our Starbucks aprons. And they're like, it's okay, Julia, like you're gonna be okay. And I was like, no, because it makes sense. Like you're right. They were right. And so we just talked every Damn. shift after that for hours and hours wow. and hours. And about just all about it. And all of a sudden it was like, once I saw, I could not unsee. And it was like an onion. It was layer after layer after layer. So that night when I went home, um, I walked into my dorm at 12.01 PM. So you know who was right around the corner was this security chick who rolled up on me real fast and was like, get out here. You're being written up. I was like, literally, this could be a difference of our watches at this point, like it's Mm. like 30 seconds, like give me a break. I'm almost in here. And she goes, well, once you get in there, you still have to get undressed and get ready for bed. And that's going to be awake time. Are you telling me when to go to sleep and like how brush? What if I want to get into bed just like this? Like mind your business. Like it doesn't matter. But she was like, no, you're getting written up. You have to show up to the Dean's office tomorrow morning at 6 a.m. And I was just like, this is crazy. So my other friend who I was with got written up as well. We show up to the office. She's scared out of her mind. But my attitude immediately was like, yeah, dude. Try me. Like, <laughs> yeah. try me. Like, what are we going to do here? And she was look, kept looking at me like, Julia, how are you just so okay? I'm like, because this is ridiculous. Like, yeah. I am like 19 years old. I got written up for like being 30 seconds over this crazy Bogus. curfew. Like, no. So he said like, what's the reason? And I was like, the reason is I just crossed the threshold of my dorm 30 seconds too late. Like, I shouldn't be here right now. And he went through this whole, like, don't challenge me kind of posture. You know, I was like, well, these are the rules, Julia. And I was like, I understand, but they're dumb. You said that? I'm 19. Yeah. And I was like, I should not have a security person roll up on me for crossing the threshold of my dorm. Like, either you trust us to be adults or you don't. Like, I understand a curfew. You're trying to keep people safe. You guys are responsible for us. But 30 seconds, can we be real? Like, Mm. Why am I here? I should be sleeping because I have work and I have school. And I and my friend was just like sitting there shivering, like, I can't believe he's yeah, confronting yeah. the dean. But I felt so empowered by this conversation I'd had the day before, these conflicts that I had had with these people who I was trying to just like ask questions to who were like shutting me down. I'm like, I'm not even trying to be a pastor here. I'm just yeah. saying like, this just doesn't make sense. The math isn't mathing and nobody wants to admit it. Like, I, and nobody wants to talk about it. And if you try to talk about it, they're like, it's just not for you. Like, it's just not for you. Yeah. Wow. And so I, that was when it started for me. And so at that point, I remember the more I would talk to my friends and the more things that I started to see. So you stayed in the school. I stayed that. in the, well, oh, the wow. reason I stayed, I had like a month left, I think at that point. And I remember thinking, if I leave early, I'm going to have to explain to my parents and to my family oh, and wow. to the church. So I much have to fear. explain to them because we were so, the church was our life. Totally. I'd have to explain yeah. to them why I left early. Yeah. And I'm not ready to do that because they're gonna t- they're gonna kick me out. They're gonna disown me. I don't have a place to live. I don't have anywhere to go. I don't have mm. enough money to go live on my own. 
what am I going to do? So I was like, you know what? I just need to ride it out for one more month. No, you're fine. And I would ride out for one more month, finish, get home, figure out what I'm going to do. Mm-hmm. So I did that. So I like just yeah, put just, my head low. Yeah. I did took as you know many hours at Starbucks as I could, finished. I didn't even really care about my grades, which is so unlike me now. I was just like, just yeah. get it done, do what I need to do, check in, check out. And I left, like, when are you coming back? And I'm just like, uh-huh, think about it. Bye. You know, I got home and I immediately, like, so I started working at Starbucks again, just transferred back up to the store I'd been at. I got a nanny job in the afternoon. So I'd work 4 a.m. to 11 at Starbucks. I'd go pick up the kids that I nanny for starting at 12 to 3, take them home, do the whole mom thing for them for a couple hours. Great family. I'd drive from their house to another job at 5 p.m. for a restaurant. And I was a a hostess and I would be then done at like 10 p.m. So I worked three jobs. I was just trying to keep myself busy. 100%. So busy just, and to save as much money as I could. Yeah, so like if I'm going to go. Like, the second you give your truth to anyone, they're like, hey, get out and, of here. Oh, anyone, anyone yeah. at all. And I was like, nobody can know. Yeah. And I need to just like, like, you know, grind this out, make as much money as I can and stay out of my home and out of like disconnect from my responsibilities at right. the church as much as possible. Cause I, I don't even know, I don't know anyone I can talk to about right. this. And um, so I stayed so busy, just completely burnt myself out working three jobs. I eventually got offered a job. Well, actually at that time I thought, um, you know, maybe I should just like leave, but I kept thinking, where am I going to go? I don't have anyone outside mm-hmm. of the church. And I had a few friends outside of the church, but I was so scared. Like, uh, can I count on them? Like, I don't know. And yeah. I had this really serious conflict of like, I want to leave this church and this institution because I see things now that like, I can't unsee mm-hmm. and I can't reconcile, but I don't necessarily want to leave God. And I don't know that I'm done with like, I, I don't know anything other yeah. than faith too. But I was scared because in our, that culture, we were very much programmed to understand if you leave this, you're you're done. Done, done, right? Yeah. Like nobody outside of these walls is doing it right. It's black and, and white. And so it's very black and white. So it's like either you're on this path or you're on the wrong one. One way or the highway. Exactly. Yeah. And so I remember just thinking, well, I can't, I can't do anything. Because if I leave this, I lose my church and I lose my family. Because yeah. they are not, yeah. they're not going to understand. family, church. Everything was going to go all away. All of community. Totally. So I remember like looking into, okay, maybe a way that I can leave without actually leaving. Maybe I'll apply to like, those uh, overseas mission mm-hmm. <laughs> missions, like with YWAM and things like that. And I started applying YWAM. to like, I mean, there, and they're a whole other problematic, oh, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. Hillsong. I applied for Hillsong wow. School of Ministry because I loved music and leading worship and all that. Like, I, I just need an avenue that will be acceptable to them, yeah. but that will get me get out, out, get of me it, yeah. away. And I'll figure it out then when I get there. Um, at that time, I had taken another job that freed me from working three jobs. I was able to just work one. And um, right at that point where I was just really, really trying to leave, uh, there was an attempt to try to get me betrothed to someone who I very much did not want to be with. And it at made- At the college? At the church. And- uh, um, After you are like left the college? Yeah. Well, after I left the college, yeah. So it was a very messy, the pastors were involved. My family was heavily involved. Like this guy said he's supposed to marry you. Like you should marry Almost him. Almost like a planned marriage. Almost, but it was because he came to me and said, God told me I'm supposed to marry oh you. that whole God. thing, right? We know this person, right? We, uh, no, actually, okay, no. <laughs> <laughs> no, um, and I won't say any names. And like this person now, li- you know, they're a great person. I, I don't really know them very much anymore, but what I do know of them, like they've, they're they not this person anymore. Yeah, yeah, okay, yeah, like that sure, needs to be said. For sure, for sure. But um, they said, like, I'm supposed to marry you. But God, how crazy. they had said some really terrible things to me when people would make jokes about, oh, are you guys dating? And would make some very awful comments that were like very abusive comments. And I won't say them out again. It's just not, yeah, yeah, nobody knows. Just the misogyny person, of the it culture. It was misogyny yeah. and it was very, very toxic. And I remember just being like, why would you say that even to a friend? Like, that's terrible to say that. So then when this big heart change happened, he's like, I'm supposed to marry you. I'm like, whoa, yeah. <laughs> what? Hey there, buddy. And yeah, and, but he was friends with my family and my family was like, this is the one. This is, and nobody would listen to me when I would say, I, I, this is not so what scary. I want. So leaders in the church, families in the church who are really, you know, influential to and close with my family, they're like, Julia, this is it. This is the right thing. I'm like, no, you guys, like, I don't feel this and I don't believe this and I don't think this is right. But they kept pushing, like, this is it. So I started because I was this very, we'll talk about purity culture another time, but yeah. I was on that purity culture path, hardcore. I hadn't dated anyone. I hadn't given in to any temptations for anything. Totally. I had I had rejected advances left and right yeah. for a while. 
And I was like, no, I don't want this person. It's yeah. not right for me, but nobody would listen to me. And it was, so I started to think like, maybe I'm wrong. Maybe they're all right and they know better than me because I had been conditioned to believe authority figures in the church and in my family. So I started to question like, okay, maybe I just need to change my heart. Cause as they kept saying, you need to change your heart toward him. Ask God to change your heart toward him. And I'm like, Oh, Ask oh, God okay. to change your heart. Yeah, so I was like, uh -huh. okay, okay, I guess I was. I really tried. I was just like praying constantly. I was fasting. I think I lost like 12 pounds in two weeks because I was just like fasting and praying and stressed and anxious and I wasn't sleeping. Also deconstructing, trying to figure out if you Ye even want to yeah, still be here. right. And I'm thinking like, uh, the last thing I want is to be like married then to this person yeah. who's like trying to be a pastor and doing all these things. Oh, I'm just like, this is uh, all going against everything that I know inside that my my intuition, my myself is screaming at me like, do not do this. But when everyone around you is saying the opposite, it's so hard when you've been entrenched in that to trust yourself totally. because it's scary. You, everything's at risk. If I were to trust myself, we know the message. You can't trust yourself. Yeah. You're yeah. bad. Well, you're, I think like at be... this point, so what, you're 20 years old at this point? Yeah. Did you even have a sense of self? No. Besides that inner voice? No, that was it. That was it. That was all. And the only and the, the couple times that I tried to challenge, right, and to kind of speak out, I was starting to recognize who who I was, but I was terrified of her because I yeah. was told all the time, like, she's terrible. She's horrible. Mm -hmm. And you're going to be terrible and horrible. Yeah. I'm like, Have oh, you okay. been able to, like, identify what who that voice is? Was it, is it the little girl? Like, is it the seven-year-old? Do you know? Like... Who is that voice? Age-wise, I don't know that I have like an age necessarily, but it's just, it's me. It's you. It's your it's, truth. It's, it's your me. spirit. It's me. Yeah. And you know what's amazing is in the last couple of years, I remember there being a, a moment in my therapy practice, in my therapy journey, um, where I finally was able to like almost tangibly grasp that being of myself mm. and to really truly hold it finally and be like, oh my God, like you're not you're not bad. You're not terrible. Like, yeah. I'm going to cry. <laughs> and I did. I like just like sobbed and wept through it. Like, you're not bad. You've always been good. And yeah. you've always been good. And that moment in my therapy journey was so pivotal because once I was able to see that and acknowledge her, acknowledge myself and to say, you're good. Like, you really are good. You've always been good. And that came through therapy, but it also came through my learning and knowing and reparenting as a mother, mm -hmm. looking at my own children and looking at my daughter and being like, you're so good. You're so, yeah. I'm so proud of you. You're so wonderful. Like everything about you that it helped me find that young girl, but also my current self and to say like, you're good. Like you oh. always have been. Yeah. And it wasn't until I made that shift that I finally was able to shift my entire perspective then about the way I carried myself through the world the way that I took care of my body, the way I took care of my mind, the way that I was felt worthy of investing time and energy into. I felt worthy of the things in my life that previously I would say, I don't know how I got this thing. I don't yeah, know how yeah. I deserve this. I would always tell my husband, like, I don't know how I got you. I don't know how I deserve you. I don't deserve you. He would always be like, what are you talking about? Mm -hmm. Like, it's crazy. Like, yeah, of course, yeah. I, we deserve each other because we're wonderful people and we like... Just denying just, yourself. But I always was. And I and I was always so afraid that one day he would see that terrible, horrible side of me mm. and that he would reject yeah. me. And he would always be like, what are you talking about? Like, I yeah. love everything about you. And he'll always say this to me too. He's like, I always saw you. Like from the beginning, I always saw you. You just didn't see you. Mm. And you didn't know like how truly amazing you were and how good you were and how deserving you are of yeah. good things. And I, once I recognized that, it literally changed everything about my life. Then all of a sudden I was able to see these still toxic or unhealthy um, relationships that were in my life that I was able to then say, nope, I'm putting up boundaries now and I'm going to do these things. I'm going to take these action steps and I'm going to heal my physical body from all this trauma that I carry because I've not felt deserving enough or I've mm. tried to change physical parts of my body in terms of just like I carried a lot of extra weight my whole life and I suffered from an eating disorder that nobody knew about for almost a decade. And mm. I just would uh, kind of abuse my body in that way with yeah. food and then restricting food and all those things. And, but it was always from a position of like self-loathing yeah. and like hate. And, mm. and then it's, it shifted into like care and nurturing and like, cause I'm good. Like I care about her and yeah. I want her to be well. And so that, you know, propelled that, but um Slightly back to that time where I finally rejected Your that advance. Marriage. Yes, where I rejected that. It made a lot of people mad. Oof. And they were just, you'll be, you know, like, you're going to regret this. I mean, even, you know, that person, 
very much made it known to me and everyone in that Starbucks that day that I would very much regret that decision. (laughs) And I was just sitting there like, well, I guess it really is just me. Because it wasn't until one girl that I knew outside the church that she said to me, she's like, Julia, this is not right for you. And I remember being like, finally, somebody somebody is like speaking with me at this level. And I was like, I felt like more empowered than to like say, no, like I can't do this. I met my husband, my now husband, just a few weeks after that. And when I first met him, I didn't even have like any, like it wasn't an immediate romantic interest. It was just kind of like, oh, okay, like I put this face to the name I had heard about him. And um, when he asked me out, we started talking a little bit more and he asked me out. I was very like, oh, okay. Uh, But I felt very safe with him. He just felt like there was something about him that was just like so different, so different. And again, I I joke about this and I'm like, your only flaw was that you're a pastor because that was the only red flag that was like, but he's a pastor, but he's a pastor, but he's a pastor. He's a youth pastor at the time. And I'm gonna be like, no, Julia, you can't do this. But everything in me was like, he is good. He is safe and he sees you and he loves you. He cares about you. Like, this is a good thing. Pursue this. And I was always checking in with my intuition about it, but some leadership at my church, some of my family members were very like, this isn't right for you. He's not right for you. You'll be back here. We know it. Like you should just. Because they just want to keep you in Calvary Chapel. Yes. And because he was very much part of like a progressive church and very, you know, and what they have referred to in the past as a false teacher spreading a false gospel. And, you know, he, he, (laughs) uh, like his theology just really freaked him out and they were like, no way. But to me, I was like, oh my gosh, I've never seen God the faith, like Christian faith, anything demonstrated in a way that really is beautiful and peaceful and nonviolent and non-judgmental and not controlling. All of those things are very true about my husband and about the way that he lives out his role as a minister of Jesus's life. You know, it's hard to use like keywords that are like hard for us. Like yeah, yeah, yeah. as a pastor, or as a Christian yeah. pastor, because it's, he, I, I feel like it's deserving in this space to differentiate that Outside of that, you know, he still would say like, oh, yeah, I'm a pastor of a Christian church, you know, whatever. But for people who've been through like what we've been through, it's important to have that differentiation, right? Because it is very different. Yeah, oh, yeah. I would never talk to a, like if I was looking for a support or like advice or mm-hmm. something, I would never go to a pastor that was affiliated with any religion. Yeah. yeah. But I have been so thankfully blessed and done a lot of healing with some amazing spiritual leaders. Mm-hmm who I know I like had to break through a lot of trauma to be okay with them because they were, they appeared to be so religious. Mm -hmm. But then I realized, God, there's so many religions. There's so many things in this world. There's so many different beliefs and with the ways people find their calling and spirituality and then like to give back. And, and so I'm still like really opposed, you know, like there's like Mm -hmm. a protective mechanism to like all of it. But I would say like in the last three years, I've started to like open up to spiritual leadership more just by like receiving yeah, you know, like having conversations or whatever, and like, and so, and me, Zach and I have been talking a lot on this cast too about how much we are opposed to like anything that has to do with you know, like our, there's been suggested in our family to have family therapy now that we have this podcast, not when we suggested mm-hmm. it forever. Yeah, we <laughs> suggested um, it for years. And they're like, no, no, no. Now that you're talking yeah, about this, we should have yeah. some therapy. And you know, we know that there's like they want a Christian therapist and it's like, it's never going to happen that way. Yeah. Never. Right. Cause it's yeah. so skewed or whatever. It's already going to be biased. Cause right there's from, real right therapy the and then. Um, yeah. <laughs> and, and there's people that we've talked about that I think might be on our podcast, you know, who are like still working in Christian mm-hmm. facilities that are really modern and like very mm-hmm. non-conservative where they're not even considered Christians, but they're like the worship leader. Yeah. Or still whatever. doing worship. You yeah. know? And like, when I found that out, I was like, I never could imagine like, what, is, what, you know, like it's hard for me to even imagine a modern Christianity because of how bad Calvary Chapel. And like, I was thinking like, cause you've been sharing s- so eloquently and yeah. so beautifully <laughs> your story. I feel like if we just had you on every day, we wouldn't have to do anything. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> this makes the podcast but, uh, so much easier. <laughs> yeah. That like when you're, you know, our mom was Catholic, like mm-hmm. Italian Catholic mm-hmm. met my dad and like, gave her life to Christ. And it was like this revolutionary thing. And I remember being a kid, like so confused how like Catholics and Christians believe in the same God though. They believe that Jesus Christ, like Christianity kind of is Catholicism. And it was like, my whole life was like really one way or the highway. And that's what was ingrained in us. So like, even you, like you had this religion or your family did. Mm -hmm. And then the Calvary Chapel church was like, it's no, that's not right. That's a false perspective. That's a false way of doing it. Yeah. 
And I find that so fascinating that like Calvary Chapel and evangelical Christianity can pull people out of Christian religions. Oh my yes. God, dude, I was going like, to mention that you're when she first said it. Yeah. Yeah. It's like different religion. It's like it shows a different you the thing. the power of the cult, man. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, you have, like, they can even pull you out of a religion that you devote so, your life to. And I remember yeah. being like my dad, you know, like every single time a Jehovah Witness would come to the door, he'd invite them in. Mm-hmm. Okay. So now yeah. I do that for different reasons. Yeah. <laughs> but like, uh, but I remember so being like so, it was so amazing to watch my dad being able to do that so like brilliantly. And these Jehovah Witnesses would like be stumped, right? They wouldn't know how to like respond. That's where you want to get them. Right? Yeah. And I just yeah. think like, that's so amazing. Yeah. But I would still always be like, I'm so confused because we all believe in the same God. Right. We all believe the same sort of things. And yet my dad, like our, the evangelical Calvary Chapel is like, Jehovah Witnesses are crazy. That's mm-hmm. a cult. Mm-hmm. Mormonism is a cult. Yep. Like, yeah, we're they'll, not call, a cult. they'll call other things a cult. Yes. But now it's like, when I think of it, it's like you have Mormons, you have Jehovah Witness, and you have mm-hmm. Calvary Chapel Evangelical, mm-hmm. I'm like, yeah. or Baptist Evangelical. Mm-hmm. It's like, these are cults mm-hmm. too that are like just at different times yeah. in history. Or Seventh-day right. Adventist, we had yeah. a, our first in studio was, which was like a fascinating, another side of it that's mm-hmm. like super culty out of the 1800s. Yeah. And like all these different sectors of men, mainly white men yes. that right. are like my mm-hmm. way yes. now. And mm-hmm. that was like Chuck. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's just absolutely fascinating to see it really how is. that happens. It really is. And so and now you're like in a relationship that's like with a pastor a that you were yeah. like, I'm never going to yeah. be with a pastor. I know. Was there like when you, as I don't even know like how to ask this, but like, was there a lot of like security in that though, that he was a pastor or like that he was doing something spiritual that you knew so much about? Like there was no blurred lines maybe? I don't know. Yeah. You know, it's interesting because I... Found, like I said, I found a lot of safety in who he was. And I just was so attracted to who he was. Just his person. That yeah. Just his personhood that I was like, ah, oh, there's just something about you. And it's amazing. And then the more I learned about his family that I'm like, they were one of the very first ex- true examples that I got to really like enter into, like to be like front row seat to. But I was like, these are very emotionally healthy individuals. And wow, these are yeah. people who uh, like he, I, rem- <laughs> I remember one one um, conversation where I said something about childhood or whatever, and I just very casually mentioned something about like, oh yeah, well, I'd, I'd get hit for that for sure. And he was like, what? Yeah. And I was like, yeah. Yeah. Like, yeah. like yeah. getting spanked, but like, you uh-huh. know, pretty like all the time. Yeah. And he was like, no, I'll never forget his posture. Like he was trying so hard to know how to react. Like, yeah. I can't, I don't want to freak out. Cause like, she's not freaking out, Yeah, but like, I kind of want to freak out. Like, this is normal. He's sat there and he's like, um, no, that's, yeah. that's not. And you're like, what? Is there something wrong with that? Not, and, I, and I was just like, this is normal. Yeah, like, you know? So and he was like, normal. Yes, yeah, so normal. And he was like, no, that I've not experienced that. And I was like, what? Like, yeah. I just looked at him like he was the crazy one. I'm like, no, explain, explain yeah. now, right yeah. here, right now. And he was like, my parents like never laid a hand on me, never screamed at me. And I was like, nope, nope, this is a lie, lies. But then I spent time with his parents and his family and I was like, he was not lying. And like, this is possible? Like, oh my God, this is possible. No wonder he's such a well-adjusted person with no childhood traumas. Like his parents did this work of like, you know, creating like emotionally. And his parents were like Christians. They were, and they were in the Nazarene church and, you know, and really like, I can't speak enough to the fact that there are, now there are some Nazarene churches that are pretty like hardcore conservative, but like in terms of like comparison to Calvary Chapel and that's, they're just, they're like apples and oranges. So I learned that very quickly um, with, through him and especially the way in which he, um, you know, acted and operated as a pastor, very trauma aware, very, Peace led, like non judgmental, um, yeah. you know, never, never preached hell and eternal, tor- you know, tor- torment. Like that was not, he's like, doesn't believe in that. I don't believe in that. Like it's just, that's not yeah. what we believe about God, of. you know. There are some Nazarene churches who do, but like, so all these things that, that I was learning about him, I was like, okay. So like they've always told us that like real faith and like real connection to God can't exist outside of these walls, but they were lying. It was just another onion just peel to like pull back. Yeah. I'm like, they were not, they were lying. Cause like, look at him and like, look at this and these ministries that he's a part of. So I did find like some safety in that because I was that place where I didn't necessarily want to leave sure. faith yeah. and God. Yeah. But I also was like, but I don't know what to do. And he was like, <laughs> here I was looking at like going overseas to other problematic organizations <laughs> to go serve at in order to get out of my 
problematic home, home organization. Church, yeah. yeah. But then I found him and I was like, there is some safety in this and some ease that like, I think like the divine or universe knows what they're doing because this is a pretty easy transition into like, well, I'm leaving the church because my, my boyfriend's a pastor. He's not like a, you know, an accountant who goes to this other church where I can bring him to ours. Mm. I need to go to his. Yeah, yeah. And so it was like an easy out kind of. And oh, I'll yeah. always be thankful for that part because it like really, even though my family was still very like upset by it because they didn't agree with that yeah. theology. They uh, ultimately, they were kind of like, okay, well, I guess that's what she's doing. Um, but I never was talked to by the pastor at the Calvary Chapel about it. It was kind of just like a, we're just going to let this go. Yeah. But some of the other leaders were like, Julia, we're concerned about this. We don't think this is the right fit for you. The theology that they believe. I'm like, I forget it, guys. Like, nope. Yeah. <laughs> um, like, I'm, I'm there. So we got married and it kind of stayed as this little safety net for me of, I feel safe enough that I don't feel like I have to do anything major to break break free anymore sure. from this cult, right? Um, but I I need to do something because sometimes I'll hear messages or see different things, you know, said by or done by Christians that I don't align with and I feel very uncomfortable being a part of. But I didn't really have the, I think at that point I was still, I was struggling so much with just a lot of other trauma, religious trauma, but also like familial trauma, like totally. childhood trauma that I was like so like drowning in it all that I was like, I just don't have time or a capacity to sort this out right now. Mm -hmm. um, a year after we got married, we became foster parents for um, uh, emergency foster placements. Wow. And then wow. after that, yeah, so we did that here in Sonoma Doing County for a, few years, <laughs> for a few yeah. years. And that was a roller coaster ride I with some Christians we knew because it was there was a lot of pushback in weird ways what? that we were like, like helping okay. children without yeah, parents? Yeah, I mean, and we, you know, generally supportive, but like there would just be some things that were like, you guys are doing too much for the parents. You know, you shouldn't be doing too much for the parents of these kids. You should just be trying to rescue the kids. And like the parents need rescuing and help too. Yeah. Like, yeah. They are, you know, things like that that were just weird and that we would just often be like, this is really incongruent with the whole pro all life, yeah. <laughs> you know, like message here, like, okay. Um, but thankfully my family was generally pretty supportive, you know, and very loving toward the babies that we cared for um, in that time. Still have a relationship with one of them that we had for um, her whole first year. Really beautiful, um, beautiful, beautiful soul. And I just will, will, will always love her and we still are in connection with her. Yeah, that's wonderful. Um, which is great. And um, then we had, then we got pregnant, had our, you know, first baby and then continued to have babies. And it was just like a, just like a, yeah. you're in the chaos You're doing of it. baby life. And I just always in the back of my mind, though, was this like, I'm uncomfortable. I know I have this trauma, but I just can't deal with it. I had to really put it on the back burner and just kind of be there to support my husband, who I knew was doing work that I I, I could see was good and, and wasn't problematic. And that was enough for me to kind of just go, okay, yeah. this is better. This is good. I can kind of rest in this now. Um, and it wasn't until... My dad passed away. Well, we lost um, a pregnancy at 16 week, uh, 12 weeks oh, wow. in 2016. Wow. And Sorry. yeah, thank you. It was That's our third terrible. pregnancy and lost the baby in July. My husband's mom was diagnosed with a terminal brain tumor in November. And then my dad passed away oh my God. January 2nd. It all Fuck. happened within six months. What year is this? This was 2016. And my dad passed away January 2nd of um, 2017. So it was like a six month period of just grief and loss and pain. Of loss. And that was when that fear of loss. I, the fear yeah. of loss and also the all of the scripts I had ever been provided about loss and grief were all just like coming up. And I'd look at them and be like, what the yeah. <laughs> yeah. this is not helpful. This yeah. is not yeah, this not is actually traumatizing yeah. to tell somebody who's lost a baby Oh, at least, you know, you have your other children that God has put in your life to care for. At yeah, least, you know, God's you can plan. get pregnant. God needed another. Ain't, oh, my God. Like things like that or about, <sighs> you know, my mother-in-law or my losing my dad. They'd say these like, you know, accolades or these scriptures or these messages of like how to cope with grief. And I just remember being like, this is not helpful at all. Mm. None of it. And people are trying to spiritualize loss and grief and pain and agony. And um, I'll never forget. Like I just remember being so like. I felt like I was stuck in a wave for those six months. Like just, I couldn't tell which way was up. I was so disoriented. And at my dad's memorial service, someone said, God chose to carry out 
this disease so that he could give glory to God even in his suffering. My dad died from ALS, Lou Gehrig's disease. So did, so did our uncle. Yes, yeah. right. I remember we have that in common. Yeah, and I'm so really sorry. Yeah, it is awful. It's awful. And I remember sitting there. I was brand newly pregnant, a couple weeks pregnant with my third, with our um, fourth child, um, our yeah. you know third living child. And I was just a couple weeks pregnant, sitting in the front row listening to this and I was like noticeably, I was sick to my stomach, my whole body. When I heard that, I remember thinking so vividly, like if God, if that's who God is, that they would choose to inflict a horrific terminal illness on a man who dedicated his life to him already, mm. who was so loving and sacrificial and cared for everyone, loved everyone. If, if that's who God is, God would take that person and go, Mm -hmm. You, I'm going to choose you because you're going to make people look at me and love me. Oh God! I'm going to have you do this and take him away from his 24 grandkids, his seven children, yeah. all these people that love him. I, I want absolutely nothing to do with that. That God. With that God. 100%. And I sat there and I was so enraged. I felt like you could probably feel it like coming <laughs> off of me that I was just like, hot. I, I could throw up. I was so sick. I was like, compose yourself, compose yourself. Com I'm sure anybody who saw me probably just thought I was a really emotional, right? Because yeah, I was yeah, and my course. dad died, but I was enraged and I'm sitting in the church that I was raised in, right? So I'm in that place already very I triggered. Ask. I was like, I'm you're going back. sitting there and I'm listening to people say these things and afterwards say similar things to me. God chose you. God knew like, and look at all those people that showed up who heard the gospel because of your dad's memorial. <sighs> and I remember being so sick and we drove, either we were driving from the church to the reception place for like lunch after, or we were driving home and I looked at my husband and through my tears, I, like, I will never ever let anyone call me a Christian again. Mm -hmm. This yeah. is not, this is not, I, I can't get behind this. Yeah. Wow. I cannot get behind a God who would do that. I can't get behind, that's sadistic. Yeah. That is awful. That's horrible. That is not a father who loves their children. Yeah. It's just not. Yeah. And I refuse. And I will never, ever let anyone put me in any group that aligns or is similar or is thought to be similar. I can't do it anymore. And my husband, who is by definition, uh, yeah. a Christian pastor looked at me with tears in his eyes. He was like, I understand. Wow. I get it. And I love you. And I'm sorry. And I hate that for you because I agree. Yeah. That's wrong. That's not who God is. God did not choose your dad to do this. God is not this self-seeking, you know, like um, egotistical maniac who's willing to let people suffer so that people will sure. love them. Like God is not so fragile that he needs that, yeah. that they yeah, especially need that. a God of love. Right. Yeah. It's not congruent. It's no. not congruent with anything that, no. you know, like it's just, and I remember him being outraged as well, being like, yeah, I get it. And so I get for you why you need to do that because this is really messed up. Yeah. And the more things that I would start talking to him about over the years and as I started working really deeply through the trauma therapy, because so I was diagnosed with complex PTSD a year later, um, Join no us. surprise. Yeah. Yeah. Welcome. <laughs> right. So, Welcome yeah. To the family. Yeah. So that was when we moved. We moved just a few months later to Pennsylvania to, you know, be supportive of his family. And after that year, I was really suffering postpartum depression. I had been separated from all my community across the country. I'd lost my dad. I didn't even know how to grieve. And so I was like, we need to go back to the West Coast. I just can't, I don't, I just can't do it out here. Like we love these people, but like it's not about the people. I just, I need this. I need mm. to go. So we did, and that's where I ended up getting into therapy. Almost a year later, I met my therapist, who I still see now weekly. Um, cool. And uh, yeah. It's a long relationship. <laughs> it is a long relationship. Man, That's she has really been cool. through it with me. She is, um, you know. Let's she's get her something. on the cast. She's, get her on the cast. <laughs> she's an incredible human being. I honestly feel so grateful that I was able to find her um, because she has been a critical part of my Totally. Healing journey. And it was so strange though, you guys, like I had never, I had been a therapist office right before my dad died. I knew I needed help and I was trying to like figure out which way was up. And I went to this like baby therapist because she was like doing her hours to get licensed. Yeah. You know? She was Zach's so- fiance is doing that right okay, now. Yeah. And yeah. I mean, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be doing that in a couple of years. Yeah, yeah, so exactly, like I get, yeah. I get it. Yeah. Like the baby part is not like a, an insult. It's just a, she was it's just, real. she was really brand new. And she was like so green. Like some of our, some of our um, sessions, she'd just be sitting there like, like, what the fuck? 
do I do okay? <laughs> like, and she's like taking her notes. Oh, and I remember man. feeling like, I think I need to comfort her. Yeah. I don't think she's okay. I don't yeah. think she was prepared for this. And so I was like, okay, this is not working out. You know, fast forward to get to Pasadena. One of the people at the church my husband was working at um, is the dean of psychology, I believe, uh, for a, a seminary down there. And he was just like a really great guy. And I asked him, I was like, can you please help me? Like, give me some direction. Who do I, who should I go to? Give me some recommendations. I need help. And it took me probably no less than five sessions, you guys, maybe even like by session three. I I, I walked in and I like, inter- you know, I talked on the phone with each of them and it was very clear, like this was the person I felt the best about, walked into her office, was like, this is it. Yeah. And it was almost like my body was just waiting for that moment where I was like, this is safe. This let is go. the person, let it go. Mm. Because it came in like a wrecking ball, like yeah. full on Miley Cyrus status, like, <laughs> yeah. whoa. And right there, You're I remember, just naked. Oh, yeah. <laughs> it's like, totally yes. vulnerable. Oh my gosh, it was so vulnerable. And I, I honestly, like, I remember a couple of sessions in going like, I'm sorry, this was kind of a lot. It was like, obviously this is just what needed to happen. But yeah. I remember thinking like, oh no, is she going to tell me this is too much? Because this is a lot. But it was just so like telling of just like how long I had just been bottling up. I hadn't even been keeping so much of it from my own husband because I didn't want him to have totally, to carry it. I was like, this is too much. You should have to carry this. Your whole life has been protecting yourself from, from everyone else. Yes. yes. Your whole life my sounds whole, like it's been like right. that. Right. And every time what I would come back, back home, every time I'd come back to Petaluma, my body would remember. Yeah, and I yeah. would step foot into my parents' home and I'd turn into this completely different person. I'd be defensive. I'd be angry. I'd be like hostile toward like everyone around me and like kind of on on guard, like yeah. ready to fight. Like, yeah, you come totally. at me, I dare you, you know? And they would, because that was the- That's what they did. That's what they did. Yep. And I remember telling my husband every time if I would go up alone, I'd call him and be like, how do I How do I keep myself from not doing this anymore? Like, I can't do this anymore. I can't, I can't survive another week there becoming this different person. That's not who I am, but why did they bring it out? I mean, it took us a long time to like uncover it. That's because you're literally walking into your childhood home yeah. where you have- Space. Your whole lifetime, it was one home I ever lived in. Wow. My one home that was full of, you know, trauma. Like, was it full of some good things too? Yes, but every good thing was always bookended by trauma, like immediate trauma before or after. And my body remembered because our bodies remember yeah, as do. much as I hate that It's like that emplaced they do. religious trauma. It's like embedded in the space. Right, right. You know? And so you walk back in and your body's like, ooh, yeah. you know, high alert, you know. And I would leave feeling like, like I've never been legitimately hung over before. Uh, and so like I would equate it though. It's like what I'd imagine that's like. I'd mm. be like, I'd get home from a trip like that. Like, I feel like I'm like emotionally hung over. Like oh, I, totally. I don't know what to do with these feelings. I feel like I just like ran a marathon and like my body, my mind, my emotions, everything is so discombobulated and I'm, I'm so confused. And I, when my husband and I were married, I think he saw me like that one time. And when we drove home, he just saw me kind of be really different in their home and be way more argumentative. And like my husband, and I don't argue. Like mm. we have, we have conflict yeah. and disagreements and we talk about it like emotionally <laughs> healthy and attuned people, but we don't fight, fight. We just never have. And so he saw me like fight, fight with one of my sisters. And I was like, yell, we were just yelling at each other. We were so defensive. Yeah, he's like, what the but hell? He, and I remember, <laughs> I remember we were driving home and I was just crying because I couldn't believe I had like let myself do that. But it was yeah. like, that's who I had to be here. I always had to fight. I always had yeah. to like, mm. you know, sur- fight to survive Survival. here. And it was just so bizarre because that was like one of the first times too that he saw. He was like, oh, wow, like there's some things I don't know about. And yeah. it took time, right? And now he does. But that was one of the times where he recognized, he's like, wow, this is really deep. Like a mm. lot deeper than I think that we know. So, so yeah, there's, <sighs> um, gosh. So, so you made it out alive. I made it out alive. Well, I feel, alive. I feel like we're like, yeah, that's what we say. We yeah. normally say that every cast, we say some of us made it out some alive, some of us don't. Yeah. But um, so yeah, we kind of like made it to you like more of like your current, but like just to like recap the traumatic parts of like what was embedded in you was like yeah. from your seven-year-old self, you were embedded with fight or flight and survival yeah. for your own life. Absolutely. A lot of the... Like, tell me if I'm wrong here, but what I'm hearing, there's so much in this, I know. But like, you know, you as a woman and like what you've been through, these gender inequalities Mm -hmm. that you experienced were like prolific in Mm -hmm. your like inner voice being like, yo, this is not right. Yeah. Just that tiny little voice. And it was women that I write that worked with you at Starbucks or was Mm -hmm. it? Yeah. Yeah, So women were like, hey, don't like. Mm -hmm. So it was like this sort of community of women. And then it was the death of your father 
that like really regurgitated all of that mm-hmm. trauma. Mm-hmm. So it's like fear of your own life, losing it to the hell, and then like gender inequalities, and then like the actual lo- like real mm-hmm. loss, and then those people that embedded you with that like religious trauma, they're like reinforcing it by being like, by the way, I know that you've been scared for your own life and any family member you lose, it's because of the same fear. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. It's like a full circle of fear. Yeah, it is. It's I, yeah. crazy. I just recently made a, a reel, you know, I started this public Instagram account and um, started to kind of share little bits of my story on there slowly, but surely it's been a little scary, but good. Like I know it's the right thing. And even just through like what three posts now, like I've connected with so many people already and I know, cool. I know it's the right thing to do. And I reached kind of a point in my healing journey where I felt like, okay, I, I don't need this for my processing. I want this to help other people. Totally. And like in, you know, venturing into like next year, I'll start a side program to become a psychologist. And this is the work I want to be doing. So it's just, is kind of laying that kind of story and groundwork for that. Um, there's that song by his name Benson something um beautiful things and I made this reel to that song where it talks basically about he met this girl he's in love with her he met you know she met his parents and but now he loves her so much that now he's afraid that God's going to take her away and so Mm. now he's plagued with this fear like God don't take away this beautiful thing that I love and the song is so emotional right Mm. and like just this like very very intense song and I heard it on the way home from school I think like a week or two ago and I had to pull over the car because I was sobbing, like yeah. sobbing so intensely that I had to do like breathing exercises to like self-regulate because that was a message that we heard from our pastors and in our church. God is a jealous God and God w- wants you to devote your love and attention only to him. If you put anything in that place, anything between you he'll and him, an it. idol, he'll take it away because that's what God does. Like mm. God is a jealous God and God only wants your attention on on him. And I remember when I fell in, when I fell in love with my husband, I was terrified. If he would leave to go on a trip for work, I wouldn't sleep. He'd come home and the house would be like so clean or I would have DIY'd something crazy. Mm. He's like, when did you do this? All night long? Because I couldn't sleep because I was yeah. afraid they were going to call me and tell me you were dead on the road or that your plane uh. had crashed. When I had my first baby, I would literally stay up for hours just watching her to make sure that she didn't stop breathing because surely God knew my human heart loved her more. Yeah. And wow. I loved this. This is so interesting deity. That, that you struggle with that. Uh, do, you, yeah. do you still struggle with that at all? Not now. No. no. Now, especially since I've really like healed through my uh, eternal conscious torment <laughs> belief. <laughs> I don't believe in eternal hell. Um, and I don't believe that about a divine creator. Because even though I don't call myself a Christian anymore, because I don't want to be aligned with this, you know. Sure. With this, I, I very much consider myself a spiritual person. And I I. I like to, whether it's because I like to or because it's true, like whatever, I think it's really beautiful, uh, the idea of a divine creator who put all of this emotion and create sure. all of us. I think it's beautiful. And I think it can create really um, beautiful connections spiritually for people with each other, with themselves. And I just, when I look around the world and when I look at my newborn children yeah. And all I see is goodness and love. And I feel the love that I feel that literally I feel like could make me explode. Mm. Like, you know, as a parent, right? Like there's just nothing like that love that makes you feel like I could I could probably just die right now from yeah, how intense really. it feels, right? If I'm to compare to, to compare that to God, to the divine creator of the universe and how much more magnified that must be when all the cosmos and the universe and yeah. everything that they've created, that they would look at it and go, ah, oh, it's amazing, it's beautiful. And like, I love them. Like that they would never see yeah. our love then for our offspring who we've created. And if all of us are a divine reflection of, like, a reflection of, of divine, divine, right? We've yeah, been told totally. you're made in God's image. If that's true, then we are born good. Yeah. And we are born deserving of beautiful and good things. Not We're not a threat the divine or an extension of them. Right. And if we, I just, my husband and I were talking about this last night as I was kind of talking about coming on here and I never want my stance um, coming out of this and in this healing to be like anti-church, ah, like sure. that, that's just not my fight. It's some people, they, they, they yeah. have to channel that rage somewhere and they yeah. do. And like, you know, I'm, I'm not going to tell them what to do with that. My, I believe so deeply at my core that my job, my mission is to hold people's hands, sometimes hold their faces, hold their bodies, whatever, metaphorically or physically, 
and remind them that they're good. Yeah. And like, if we, if we see goodness in the world, like it has to start within us and everything that we do then with our lives, if we are working from that good place of like seeing you as good and you're good and mm -hmm. I'm good at our core, but then we want good things for you. We don't want to harm you. I don't want to harm myself. I don't want to, you know, contribute to harm in the world. I want goodness. And when harm comes inevitably because broken and flawed systems and mm -hmm. trauma, sure, yeah. then Life. we want to heal and reorient back to that goodness. We start at a default setting of bad and awful and failure. It's a self-fulfilling prophecy. And 100%. so when we do mess up, well, I was prone to yeah. do that because yeah. I'm human. We're prone yeah. to wander. Yeah. Lord, I feel it, right? Like, yeah. I mean, it's it's embedded in that DNA of that, what the, you know, that message is. And I just, I can't, um, I can't justify like, operating from that place. Yeah. And there's someone that I grew up with who is very famous on TikTok, unfortunately, unfortunately, with some of these messages, because one of the messages one time that I heard them say was, before I even get out of bed, I've already sinned and I already need forgiveness. Oof. So I need to, before my feet even hit the floor, I've already failed against God and I've failed against my husband and I've failed against myself. And so I need forgiveness before I even enter my day. And if I don't start from that prayer and posture of I need forgiveness and I need Jesus to come and take over, if I just let myself be me, I'm going to mess everything up. I'm going to make mistakes. I'm going to do this. So I need Jesus to come into me and like control me. I remember, and I still think this, like, if that's the baseline you're operating from. You are going to fail all the time. All the, you yeah. are going to make mistakes all the time. And what are you doing? Like what a tortured existence yeah. to live that way so, and, and self-fulfilling prophecy to live into that because then you're operating as, well, I'm going to fuck this up. And so, sorry, Jesus, I already prayed this morning. Yeah. Or, you know, of course I let my husband down. And so I'm sorry just because I'm such a failure. Instead yeah. of, I want to put out goodness into the world today. Yeah. I want to live into my goodness. And sure, there's going to be ways I mess up. So I'm going to reorient back to that good. And I'm going to say, make this better, make amends, you know, take, you know, accept the consequences for my actions and, do better next time. Instead, it's just such a tortured way to live. But but that's how people stay controllable. Oh, totally. totally. That's how you keep them coming back for yeah. redemption. And it's a pyramid scheme. It is. So it just, it all comes circles back, right? But I just, I want people to see in themselves that they're good and to hold yeah. that inner child or at whatever stage that they need that reminder to tell themselves they're good because I just believe that that's where healing can really take place, especially in this religious trauma context. And yeah. this being the area of specialty that I'm studying and want to work in, like, I just want people to truly, truly believe that because I think that that's where it can change. And that's where it can change for generations. You know, look at my kids. And I asked my son the other day, and this is the another reparenting moment, right? I asked him, I was like, what's your favorite thing about you? Because uh, he was just being so adorable. And he goes, everything about me, actually, love everything about me. God, oh, I love, I love that. that so much. Yeah. Like, young, like little nine-year-old Julia could have never. Wow. Yeah. I like everything about me was awful. And I was yeah. a terrible, horrible mm. person already at nine. And I'm looking at him and he just was like, This should yeah, be this should be know? like confirmation for yourself that you're doing it you're was, doing it good it, as a parent. It was. And like I just I I, I was like, hey, don't make it weird. Don't cry in front of me. He, he toddled, <laughs> like, he like, just walked away, like, no big deal. Yeah. Okay, mom, random question. <laughs> yeah, and then I stood in the kitchen and just cried. And <laughs> of was like, course. Oh my God. Yeah, that's oh, so yeah, cool. You know, and hearing your kids say stuff like that, that just ends up like, oh, okay, 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 yeah. we're making it by like one generation at a time, one person, at a, one life at a time, right? Like, I, and I keep thinking this, if there's one person who hears my story, my experience and finds healing in it, it's, it's all worth it. You know, mm, is totally. it hard? Do we get pushback? Are we scared to death <laughs> to yeah. put this out into the world? Yeah. Yes, I'm scared to death. But like, I want, I just really, truly want every person to know that and to believe yeah. that it's it's changed my life in every possible way so. yeah that's beautiful <laughs> where would you say uh now that you're out of the cult yes. i would say where just like where's your spirituality now it's a great question um but you just i think that you i was gonna kind of ask something like that but like what you just said i think is like different than where me and zach have found our like I, when I came out of the church, not to like just interrupt, but just you talked so much about how like you found, you don't want people to be like pushed out of this church. You don't want them to be like, look like church to be looked at as this evil, evil thing. Cause there's, you have this divine creator that you do believe in or. Well, not, not so much about the church. I just mean that like my, my whole mission isn't to be like, ah, oh, churches be gone. Like, right. blah, like that's not my, 
that's not my agenda, totally. right? It's to like slay the organization right, of the right, church. Right, right. Do it, does it does a lot of it need a change and would it benefit from it all being torn down and yeah, being redone? built up? Like, yes, one hundred percent, one million percent. So don't get me wrong there. And I don't think that every person belongs in a church setting, yeah. especially those of us who've been traumatized by it, because if God is a God that is like a parent with their children, if your child gets harmed, gets bit by a dog. You would understand why that child doesn't want to go around dogs and you do everything you could yeah. to protect them for a while. Right. And then maybe some gentle re-exposure later on, re-exposure therapy, mm -hmm. right? So like, okay, not all right. dogs are bad, but like we're gonna, right? And be cautious. And you don't have to have a dog. You don't have to love them, but like, let's, let's detach some of that fear because sure. it doesn't necessarily, like, we don't want that fear to control your life, right? So I want to help people heal from that trauma doesn't mean I think that every person should go back into a church. Totally. In fact, I think that they shouldn't. There's some people yeah. who shouldn't um, at all. But God can be found elsewhere. Totally. You can find, like, and, and that kind of leads into your question. Like, I have found God in so many other spaces and ways. And one of those ways is by living my life in a way that my compass always orients back to, like, I want to find the good in every situation that I'm in. And if I can't find it, I want to be it. And so how do I do that? How do I act as an extension of love and goodness in maybe a scenario where there doesn't appear to be any? Or how do I take part in goodness that's already going on? Mm. Be that in a communal space, individually, one-on-one -on -one with somebody um, in a church, not in a church, in a small group, maybe, maybe in a group that does nature hikes or goes running or weightlifting. You know, there's a lot of like communities yeah. I've kind of like gotten into along the way where I've seen God show up <laughs> no, totally. in really real and tangible ways. And so for me, I don't, my spiritual journey, I think it's ever evolving because the more that I learn, the more that I know, I realize the more that I don't know, yeah. like how much I don't know. Right. Yeah, you can preach. And, yeah, preach. <laughs> and I just, I, I never, I don't think I'll ever be fixed. Right. Because on, on one, and I don't oh, think totally, we're supposed yeah. to, because yeah, yeah, we grow and yeah, we learn and we evolve. And what I do know to be true is that, that what I said, like about goodness and love, and I want to be an extension of that. And if I want a, a, a heaven to exist, all I can do is do that right now with the life that I've been given that's right in front of me. Yeah. I don't have to, I, I can't romanticize some afterlife that I'm not certain of that exists. That no could, one is could, certain could of. I, yeah. yeah. Could we say, like, could we try to say, oh, this is why it does? And I'm not going to go on some campaign that like heaven doesn't exist. This is just that's not fruitful. Mm -hmm. Like it's just not, and that's again, not my avenue. I'm not going to theologically debate people, mm -hmm. but what I believe is that God put me here right now. My life for whatever reason is here right now. And so what am I going to do with this opportunity mm -hmm. and that opportunity? How am I going to carry myself in this conversation, this interaction? How am I going to protect my mm -hmm. goodness from those people or this situation, you know? And so I think I've, I've learned a lot of really beautiful things through some Buddhist books that I've mm. read recently. Um, Pema oh. Chandran, who's a, a Buddhist monk, her, her books are just so beautiful. Um, I've learned a lot just about that and about how like our every engagement, every interaction that we it's can God. have is that God exists in it. And so mm. we can decide to contribute to good. That's what I was getting yeah. at is like, because so much of what you're talking about is like where like my, before we started this podcast and like most of my 20s was like, when I walked away from the church, it was like, I was just so aggressive being like, this is all bullshit. And like, I had a lot of anger and that anger was like, I'm not a Christian. Like, I'm not, I don't believe in God. God, there is no such thing as God. I was like this proclaimed atheist all, all of a sudden, but deep down inside, I was praying every night. Mm -hmm. I like out of fear. I was like still praying before my meals. And I lived that way for like a year amongst like, and like, the like very similar to you. I didn't have space. I, there was so much trauma that like I couldn't even. There was no desire for me to even think about God or anything. I just like shut it off. And then psychedelics, like, was like this sort of like Buddhist sort of like oh my god, God isn't everything, right? It was like whatever. Like I just acid or like you know shrooms or whatever was like an opportunity just to like re see the world a little bit mm -hmm. differently. And it was like, oh my God, everything's breathing yeah. and talking to me. <laughs> and like you touch a tree and you'd be like, I am the tree. And like, so there's like this, the connection that it was like Brahmin or like the God, like mm -hmm. you are God or whatever, which my, like, my goodness, like you tell a Christian that like, it's not Jesus through you. I am God. They're like, yeah, false prophet. <laughs> yeah, they hate right? that. But mm -hmm. I picked that up like my mid twenties that it was like, what if it's not this like 
because I 100% agree with everything you're saying. And I think that like, what if like, there's like this idea of being an appendage of God or like this extension of God and like Jesus threw me and it was like walking in Jesus' footsteps, like all these connections of like this, like connection to right. God. And like the more and more I've like removed the damaging parts or like really started to go deeper into this trauma, I've started to feel God is like this person in me that like self is extremely godly. Like it is yeah. God those cosmos are like within me. And I would say like for me, like plant medicine really has helped reorient to like detach from this idea of like an appendage or like an extension and more of just like what you just said, like literally God is in everything. That's not like a, like, in, and when I say that, it's like, I don't like us, I still am opposed to like a being. I'm still opposed to this like entity or this mm -hmm. thing that is that. Right. It's more of like a, a mindset and a space of just accepting and surrendering to the moment and to like, and that into like gardening has become like, was something that I picked up like my late twenties that was like so meditative and very Buddhist and like very mm -hmm. like so tedious, but like just being able to see the process of like taking this like life in a seed that is just being held in a capsule and then you plant it in soil and it produces life was so Christian. Like the experience felt so Christian. Then I was like, wait a minute. Christianity just took from the truth. Yeah. Like the truth isn't everything in our lives. And what humans do is they're like my way or the highway and they're picking real truths they're, from yeah. the truth. They don't have monopoly on that. Yeah. Like yeah. on the divine they're not the, at all. And, or creation totally. or anything. Yeah. So they're like so much that we were taught or embedded with that is like so powerful yep. and manipulated. And that's what fucked it up so bad. And so. But that's what also yeah. gives it the strength it has. I feel like that's what like the cult, especially like the power of Calvary Chapel, like can pull people out is because they are, some of the things they're preaching are very true. It feels like, and God, you are God. Like no, they would never say that, but like uh, you are built in the image of God yes. is a very similar to that, that idea of God is everything. Right. And then they use that and then they manipulate it and they put a man. Well, yes, a man, <laughs> but also the cognitive dissonance that has to exist in that, right? If you're an extension of God and if you are like God in you, right. And you're a reflection of God. How do we then justify things like genocide? Yeah. How do we oh, other? Yeah. How do we other? There's a whole other podcast, right? But like, how we've been do, talking how, about it a lot. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But like, how how do you then say like the death penalty? How do how do you then look at that person and go, you, oh yeah, you carry the image of God, um, but you should die because of that. Like we get to, we get to be the judge now. Like we get to do yeah. that. Either either they are an extension of God and we need to treat them as such. Or they're or none of us are. Yeah. You know, so like that there's so much cognitive dissonance that mm -hmm. exists. Yeah, you it's really like, did just open the earth. I know. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, no. No, but uh, like one of the things that I think about that is like, you know, there's a lot of people who hear, you know, and I'm sure you guys are familiar with this language too of people who are like, Well, what if you're wrong? And what if what if what you know if, on judgment day when you die, Nathan? What if you're wrong? You know, and, and I've just been thinking about this a lot and um I was watching a TikTok video recently of someone kind of explaining this. And I agreed so much and I don't know who it is to give credit, but it was something along the lines, like if I get, if I die and there is a heaven and a hell and it's real and I get up there and God sees me and can look at my track record of always aiming to do good to like, you know, being like trying to be loving trying to be caring, not contributing to trauma, trying to be a healing agent in the world in my own ways, even though it wasn't praying a prayer and being a part of a church, if God could look at my whole rap sheet <laughs> and look at all of that and go, mm, you're out yeah. straight to hell for you. She's like, if that's who God is, I don't want to spend yeah, an yeah. eternity Obviously with them. Not. No, thank you. Yeah. I'll take that. I'll yeah. take it. Cause like, if these are not the kind of people that will be there, yeah. I don't want to be there. Yeah. Totally. And if the people that are going to be there, are these really loud, judgmental, hateful, yeah. hurtful people? Yeah. You know, it's, it's like, it's almost like you guys have kind of ruined this. <laughs> also, and at least, at least you lived one life. Right. Like if, if, if I am wrong, right. at least I didn't live it in such a oppressive, like non-present way. way. Yeah. Happiness didn't exist really when I was like lost in the faith. Cause it was always covered by fear yeah, and fear of damnation and, right. and fear of God. Right. And so you take that away and it's like, oh no, I can actually feel pretty happy about things right. now and let go of it right. and live and, this life. And living for eternity, right? Yeah. Of that, like, so we're like, oh, we're just, we're just live eye on the prize. And it's like, yeah. but you're, you're totally neglecting all this other reality yeah. going on around you. This Dang. one life that Dang. we have. Dang. This idea of eternal life too, like billionaires, right? And it's like, there's so much new science and trying to extend life, extend life, live a longer life. 
And so if you're being, if you have the gift of eternal life, ding, 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 you just made like, you know, (laughs) billion dollars. Who needs church anymore if you can live eternally? Well, and it's it's tapped into all of our deepest fears. Yeah. Exactly. It just has. And it's. In our culture, for sure. Right. But like what you're talking about, like Buddhist religions or or, um, Taoism, like Hinduism, a lot of the Eastern religions, death is, or just like in Hispanic culture mm-hmm. and like other cult, like you get out of white culture. Mm-hmm. Really, it's white culture. It if you get out of it white is. culture, death is something that isn't really always as scary. It's celebrated. Right. Right. It's, it, and there's a lot of, yeah, there's a lot of different I, things. I, I wouldn't say that for every culture, though. I mean, no. there's still other religions that are just as oppressive. Oh, no, no, yeah. Right. Totally, totally, totally. Yeah. It's just not looked at as like, um, I guess, in the same way of like, this is the worst, it's the end. And it's the like a, a healthy cycle of life. It begins with life and it ends with death. And we yeah. have a healthy understanding. That's how it works. Right, and sometimes right, right, there's right. tragedy and it takes it away too soon. And we mourn in a different way for that, right? But um, death is like the end in our in the Christian world. It's like, okay, that's the end and it's, we're yeah. going to die. But then it's also like, well, why are you so afraid to die if heaven is waiting for you on the other side? And it's so amazing. Don't Heaven's like get there? super cold, really loud, and it's all gold. <laughs> <laughs> Shiny. <laughs> they made it like as a kid, you're like, wow. But then you're an adult, you're like, but, I don't know. But you have a new body. Yeah, brand new. And a mansion <laughs> and yeah. a crown. Come yeah, on. It's and amazing. your crown's bigger than the guy next door. So like, yes. you're doing it, you know, adding jewels to your crown. Also, <laughs> quick, quick comment, just on the massage. <laughs> no Xbox, no TV, no no podcast. Just on the misogyny of, of the culture we grew up in. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I die. I go to heaven as a man. Powerful, right? Mm-hmm. Powerful as a man. Mm-hmm. What's the woman's job in heaven? What's the woman's celebration well, she's in heaven? Cooking and cleaning. And exactly. She's probably putting on the polishing the gold. Who's going to polish the gold? Gonna polish yeah. The gold? yeah, exactly. That is a lot of gold. There's no talk of that. Like, what's the woman in heaven? No. Is there well, gender in heaven? No. Is there well, gender? There's, there's no. God but, doesn't have a gender. Or like, yeah. even in the Bible, like, let's. If we're going to go oh, that it's route, preach God. Like, so, oh, God's no. a man. Oh, like, God it's definitely has to a me penis. Man, we got to know. Like, we have to. <laughs> oh, like we just got it. That's just a given, right? But like, so if you're going to get hermeneutical, if you're going to dissect yeah. some of the names for God, they're, yeah. they're gender neutral. They yeah. don't have a yeah. gender. So when you call God, they or them, who not mm. only did you use these pronouns, but like, yeah, whoa. you would God yeah, is talk a, about God, gender on a spectrum. Yeah, yeah, right. God is a man, <laughs> only a man. It's like, why? Why can God only be a man? And, ma- yeah, and, masculine, and why, feminine. And why did, why, if, if that's such a big part of this, why did Jesus come through the form of a woman? Yeah. Why did he use a woman to bring the Messiah into the world? And why did he why did they use women to be the ones to discover that Jesus had risen from the dead? Why were they the preachers of that good news? Yeah. But like, yeah, we can't let them speak in church. Make nah. them shut up. Like we can't yeah. do that. Jesus used them to announce that he had overcome death, but we're not going to use them for that. <laughs> Women are like, used for everything in the Bible. Yeah, yeah. but it doesn't. Used. But, <laughs> used. Used. Well, but like, I mean, that, those those are some pretty critical, yeah. like, like pivotal points, right, in the like story of Jesus that like totally. came through a woman, uh, was, you know, like cared for on the cross by a woman, was discovered to have overcome death by a woman. By a woman Yet women need to shut up in church and don't get to have a position to yeah. lead. And she's like, that doesn't make sense. Especially the overcoming of death. Like right. that's such a big part right. of the religion. Yeah, that's what makes it. It's like history yeah. will tell you, oh, Jesus did live. So no one's denying that. Right. But history doesn't tell you Jesus was risen. Right. And so the religion is like, no, he did rise. Right. And that's what we live for. Right. And right. So if a, if a woman confirms that, it's like, well, a woman confirmed that. Let's keep that over here. Yes, but let's not talk let's about, not about that. that. Men. Yeah. Yes. What's fascinating <laughs> is like in my plant medicine journeys and like really deep dives into finding spirituality and like these godlike figures in our cosmos and whatnot, almost every godlike energy that I've come in contact with that's been like whatever my experience yeah. is, they're like extremely feminine mm. energies, yep. almost all feminine energies, just from like well, not, not putting gender, just the spectrum of like these energies and... So much of my healing has been internally becoming my own mother, right? And like, because I've been a really good dad to myself, like that heart, like Christians, I don't know, like evangelical Christianity is like the, right? These men reinforce these toxic masculine ways into all of us. And, uh, and so my, like, so much of my healing, what, what like the other side of the healing has been, has been like me embracing so much of a feminine energy and like breaking down my gender. Yeah. And it's funny because I'm like, this happened, started happening like last year, but so much of my, so much of this religious deconstruction did that. And it was so scary because it was like, wait a minute, I've always had this feminine energy. I've always had these like bisexual tendencies. 
Um, but this toxic masculinity was just like enwrapped in me, right. you know, it's mm. like every way you deal with your emotions is going to be fear than anger, you know, and like demanding your way or the highway. And this is how it's going to be. And like, um, I, uh, I also find it fascinating that like you are the second woman that we've had on. Right. Yeah. Um, and y'all's experience is so different. It's like, we have all these similarities, but this awareness of purity culture and this awareness of like gender inequality mm -hmm. did not hit me until I was way out of the church. And like, even now I'm like, even though I feel like I'm so well more like, I don't know, woke on these mm -hmm. topics, thanks to my fiance, who's just like a godsend, no pun intended, <laughs> but um, <laughs> um, has been fascinating to see how blinded men are in this Christian church from having any sort of awareness of gender inequality, right? It's like shel sheltered so perfectly that it was like probably the scariest thing for me was breaking down my sexuality and accepting right. like powerful feminine energy, which now is like ruling my life. I love it. Yeah. <laughs> Here for it. You know, um, I don't remember if I talked about this already that I recently submitted um, this piece of research that I've been working on uh, to the American Psychological Association wow. for a cool. poster. Uh, yeah. So I haven't heard back yet. If Wait, what is it for? It. You didn't so um, American Psychological Association, they're like the big, yeah, 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 you know, yeah. like oversight yeah. for psychology in America. And they have a national conference every year. And there's this exhibit hall where students and, you know, student researchers can present on a poster their research so that people can either, you know, just learn from it or they can say, hey, I like that. Come do that at my college or I'd like you to be a yeah, part yeah. of my study and take that data with you, whatever. Um, and it's just a really great place to kind of get feedback, to get recognition, to see if this is something that like other people, other professionals in the field want to pursue with you or have a place for you to do that. Especially a uh, priest's ID too. Yeah. Like it's really yeah. good for your resume. Yeah. Oh, totally. Yeah. Well, and so my professor last semester was, he pulled me aside after my presentation. Actually, he didn't pull me aside. It was in front of the entire class. And he mm -hmm. went, Julia, have you done anything with this data? Have you submitted this anywhere? Have you tried to post or present this? I was like, no. <laughs> he was like, well, you need to. And yeah. I'm going to tell you how. And so I submitted um, my abstract for it um, in early January. And the, um, the, a conference is happening in August in Seattle. So I haven't found out yet if they've accepted it or not. If they do, I make this poster with my research. If they don't, I'll try to submit it to a few other conferences this year on the on the West Coast, and I'll try again next year. But, oh my God, tell me but, the research. So the research I'm is so about interested. religious trauma and the impact on sex and sexuality. So I conducted a very small scale, not, uh, it's like not remotely meeting all the criteria totally. for like a legit study because I was I was in my associate's yeah, degree. Totally. And I decided to take my human sexuality topic, my research topic, and I asked my teacher, I was like, can I, instead of a five page or six page research paper, can I expand this a little more? And can I include a survey that I just like to take because of my wow. particular upbringing and unique experience? She was like, absolutely run with it. Yeah. Like, you know, she's like, I'm teaching associates, uh, associates level. Yeah. Like, I don't get to see this a lot. Yeah. So like, do it. And I was like, yes. So what I did is I just created a Google Forms survey. Yep. I did put like a little disclaimer in it. It's like I knew a couple things to do, but I hadn't even taken research methods sure. yet. And so I was like, I, I, and I thought maybe 50 to 100 of my friends might take this maybe, right? Because I knew like I grew up with people yeah. that are going to see this and maybe they'll just take this survey. And it was mostly about like, okay, what the messages that you were taught when you were a child and an adolescent and how they've impacted you then, how they impacted you then about your relationship to your body and how, and sexual, and your sexuality and sexual experiences um, pleasure, things like that. And then now how it's translated into adulthood. So it was this like 28 question, I think, um, survey. And at the end, I put this, <laughs> I made this mistake. It was a good <laughs> mistake and a bad mistake. But a little like, it's all anonymous. And I said like, there's just a little like box where if you have any thoughts, you could just like write a little note to me if you want to add anything to this. Right. There were a couple of people that were like, this is unnecessary. Why are you doing this? This is making <laughs> yeah. the church look bad. And I was like, mm, okay, yeah. okay, whatever. <laughs> right. But there Typical. were, so 728 what? people, you guys wow. took this survey. When was this? This was two years ago. Oh my wow. God. 728 people. So the link got shared on my social media, but then my friends were like, give me the link. I'm going to share it on mine. I'm going to share it in this deconstruction group I'm a part of. I'm going to share it in this other group I'm oh a part of. God. I'm going to share it from my platform and this platform. It went crazy. And at yeah. one point when it was at like three or 400, I, I told my husband, I was like, babe, should I just like shut this down? Like, this is crazy. Like, I don't yeah. know if I can handle like it's this level. Like, research. It's a lot. And he was like, no, the more data, the better. Yeah, like, yeah, this is totally. great. Like, he's like, there's like, you, you know, hit, this is. You hit something. Yes. And I was like, and it was very affirming that like, I knew that like religious trauma and sex and sexuality was what I wanted to pursue. Yeah. That was it. It was like yet another confirmation. Like, this is so needed. And the peep, some of the messages you guys 
when I when I start publishing a little bit more of this stuff, like more openly, and like I'm eventually going to pub, like write a book about this, and this some of this will cool. be in there. Um, some of these messages that were left to me, I had to I had to read them in like a four week time span because they were so heavy. There were probably about five hundred, maybe five hundred and fifty or so responses in there. So out of seven twenty eight. More than half of the people wrote in there, like some comments to me about their own experience oh or the experience of their wife or their husband or their ex-husband or whatever. Did you read them all? Yeah. I eventually oh, wow. got through them. It yeah. took me about a month. I the reason imagine. being is that I would read them and They're I would heavy. just cry. They're and heavy. it was so heavy. Again, affirming, but deeply yeah, you're heartbreaking. you're so connected oh to your research. Exactly. And I would have to take breaks and I'd talk to my therapist and be like... Okay, like this one, what is this? And she's like, okay, like, let's, you know, talk All about it. All for like, one class. For one class. So wow. I ended up writing, I messaged my instructor, or my professor, and I was like, so this paper, and she was like, I'm here, put it all in there, put everything. It turned into a 14 page research yeah. paper. She sat down with me for an hour and a half after I put in the paper, and she was like, Julia, this is unreal. This is incredible. She's like, there's people in their PhD programs who don't get this many research responses. Yeah. Like, people pay to get that many yeah. people to respond. Like, what you totally. have is so important. She's like, maybe you didn't do all, like, the little technicalities to get this to a peer-reviewed level, but that doesn't mean the data doesn't matter. Yeah. You can still use it to support ongoing research. Yeah. So when I submitted this research proposal, I was able to include some of this, like, I already did this one small skill, you know, non-peer-reviewed study. This is what it has shown which indicates more research is needed in this area. So this is obviously something I'm very, very oh passionate about. And that I think like more people need to become aware of who are still operating in church settings, yeah. especially if they're trying to do it more holistically and peacefully and well. Like my husband is all about, he's like, I just, I need, we need to know everything about how to do this from a healthy psychological wow. trauma informed standpoint. And he's very gung ho about that in his space, in his, you know, ministry position. And I just love him for that because rare. that's, it is so yeah. rare. I mean, he's like, in so many ways, he's such a unicorn and especially in this, like, so it's, it's just always important for me to like asterisk. Yeah. <laughs> yes, I am married to a pastor. I don't consider myself a pastor's wife because that's a very loaded yeah. Yeah. title. Um, and I was given very, very kind permission to let go of that title by another pastor, um, the psychologist friend of mine. And he was like, you doesn't have to, you don't have to hold on to that. Like yeah. you, you actually date, he's Julia Myers' husband. That's, <laughs> not, that's not, you're not the pastor's wife. That's, that's your husband, yeah. you know? Um, and differentiation was important for me at that time. It was good. But he, you know, he's very like invested in this as well. Cause he's like, I want to know how, how do we help other people not keep yeah. doing this? And how yeah. do we take people's stories like yours and all these other people that you are in connection with and who've been hurt? How do we, we, our job isn't to force them back into a church. Our job is to help them heal yeah. and to then find God in their own way, to find to find wholeness in their spiritual practice totally. in their own way. Um, yeah. And so anyway, so that research, I'm really excited because I'll know in a couple of weeks, hopefully, where that's going. And so there's going to be a lot more oh, I so to talk about. It'd be, it'd be amazing to, to uh, so like this wouldn't come out for a while or? Mm -hmm. Well, I would write, I would create the poster presentation for August. So once I hear like, yes, you're in, I'm going to create it for August. And then it'll be something I could share with people if they wanted to see it, but it's, it'll yeah, be just love, like a big, you know, share it here. yes. <laughs> um, but in terms of like ongoing research, it'll be, you know, I could potentially, if I were to present there, I could get an offer to go do research at a school somewhere for my doctoral program. Oh, it's endless research, or, whole country. To, to, yeah. And when tons of opportunity, right, Dude, to connect. Any county, you'd be the, like, I'll work here. Yeah. <laughs> well, no, it's the, it's the it's, funding. that That's where it's right. like, like. Of course, the research is true. And yes. of course, we know it. Right. And we know there's right. millions of people that have something to say. Right. It's one, getting the funding and like the legal okay to go do the research. And then you can do the research. And to be able to do it. But to properly. have something like that, yeah. even 700 and something people yeah. and be like, hey, like just this small amount of people agree. That's enough to be some sort of funding and oh, push it some sort of way. Totally. And to get that kind of support then at an academic level with other psychologists and researchers, totally. you know, is just like huge. So I'm really excited because- I see people, you know, um, like Forrest, right? Forrest, yeah. who was on here. Forrest Benedict. Um, Forrest Benedict, who's on here. And other people who are also doing similar work in deconstructing purity culture, which again, we'll have to do a whole other yeah, cast absolutely. about this, a conversation. Um, it gives me a lot of hope because there's a lot of people like around my age and kind of the like decade-ish ahead of me who were very steeped in that in the 90s mm -hmm. <laughs> and um, yeah. early 2000s that, where it was like really, really heavy, but it still exists. It's still very prevalent. Oh, it's very real, yeah. Um, and so in terms of two of like women's roles, right? And in, in that, it's, gosh, it's like, 
that experience is wild. I mean, yeah. I even just talking to my husband recently about his experience at like summer camps, Christian camps, and he's like, well, it was like this for me. It was like no big deal. And I'm like, oh, oh my, my God. God. Yeah. Yeah. Well, we're going to talk about this or if we're really going to yeah. talk about this, let me tell you about how this is like for a girl. Like, oh. let me tell you how this experience is wildly yeah. different. And so there's just so many ways that it really does matter because women are held to a different standard. Can I ask you with your, the research, those 700 plus people that responded, was it heavily women? Did you get a kind of both men I and did, women? I didn't actually. So here's one, a couple of things. I didn't get age or sex, gender demographics. So it's just anonymous. It's totally actually. Is it? Did I get male and female? Maybe I did that. Maybe I did male and female, and then a d- denominational um, affiliation. I'm pretty sure I did. I'm pretty sure that that um, the sex question, you know, male, female, non-binary, anything like. I, I'm pretty sure that I. Did not remember to put that one in. Hmm. And that was like a late, I literally took research methods the next semester, you guys. And I was like, damn it, I could have done this and this and this. I just like, and all of I that would imagine, would have, like, like not, this is all speculation, but I would imagine very few men would see that opportunity to take a, that like questionnaire. Honestly, there were a lot of comments though from what I could tell were, were men because they were like, oh, my wife, this or this. And then my relationship with my girlfriend or my wife or I was gay, but I yeah. was married and then I left. And so there actually were a surprising amount of men. I I don't know. I'd have to kind of go through the comments again and see if I could maybe if they used their own you yeah. know pronouns to kind of like indicate. But either way, it's something a lot of people are very eager to talk about. Because yeah. there's so much healing and feeling validated in that experience. Just because it's such it. a sacred part of who we are. Um, so it's something that I'm just really excited to pursue. It's heartbreaking. And right. And yeah. it's, so it's a heartbreaking thing to be excited about, but I'm excited because of the freedom that it will give a lot of people yeah. and the healing that it will and allow people and myself. Like you're, yes. it means like I always say, like we actually end up being the real lucky ones that get to do this like all the time talk about our trauma over and over and over and get deeper and deeper and then learn from so many other people's stories where we just are like, like it's, yeah, it's amazing to like jump into something like this where we have such a strong connection to it in our lives Mm -hmm. and are on that healing journey. And then to like link arms because we're not really meant to be alone in this life, right? We're like communal human beings. Which is another way they get you. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. Their community, our community or the, you know, everyone else is bad. Um, my last, one of the things to like, cause I know we've been going for almost two hours. Yeah. Oh my gosh. Um, you've really kind of captured a lot of your life here, your childhood, your teenage, your young adult, your marriage. And then like, we've like learned so much about how you've deconstructed inside of a marriage, right. Where you guys have figured out the last person we had on for us, Benedict, who him and his wife that he shared with us deconstructed together. Whereas like you're with somebody that allows you to deconstruct for you. And like, I have, I'm kind of blown away. That's so amazing that that that's amazing. possible, that it is possible. Okay. Mm-hmm. You can do it. Yeah. Um, yeah. And you're like really proof of how that looks. And um, I can only imagine like just how much you've been through in your relationship and how much you've grown because of it. And, yeah. and you have like such a self in you now, like, you know, like, yeah, you're this married woman, but you're not the pastor's wife. You're Julia Myers. You plus like. I said like so much about la- like fear of loss and death that like led your life. But then also you like made such an emphasis on lack of education that you were aware of mm-hmm. in your like high school years. And you're now like becoming a doctor. Like, come on, dude. Like, I fucking love it. Oh, yeah. You've really. Well, your drive um, for academics was early. Even you just wanted to go to like a, a, a Christian school or whatever. Like you were driven to be cr- like critical thinking and ask questions. And now here you are like trying to become a researcher yeah. in psychology. It's, like yeah. it's, it's pretty, it takes a lot to get to a PsyD level yeah. and to also be able to do the research. And you did it at an associate's level. You're passionate. Like you already did yeah. some, yeah, you're passionate about yeah. it. Well, and it's interesting because one of the things that was really like another kind of area of control, right, is if you keep people uneducated, oh, yeah. you keep Brilliant. them easy to control, Brilliant. right? Especially women, because then you tell them, this is your role, you should get married and have babies and then, then you submit to your husband and you live, you know, happily ever after. Like, okay. Um, but I, I always feared, right? Like I'm, I'm not smart enough to like go to school. I'm not this or that or whatever. And it took me years to finally feel like, okay, actually I've always loved people. People always come and talk to me about all these things, deep things. Like I'm such an empath. Like I feel like I want to help people now Mm. that I've been in this journey myself. Like I want to help people heal as well. So how do I do that? And, um, it was actually my therapist who helped me kind of like uncover that, like, I think that I should work in this field, like in mental health field. 
And when she supported that wholeheartedly, I was like, okay, she would tell me if I was like not <laughs> kind of mm-hmm. this. She would be honest with me, right? Um, and so I started going back to school um, summer of 2021, and. I have maintained a 4.0 ever since Damn. then. Um, and I, nerd. that, <laughs> I know, I know, I know. I, very much nerd. Um, but, and at first I really was like really heavily trying to pursue that for my associate's degree and to finish out my associates at a 4.0 because it was a gift I was giving to my younger self to say like, you were never stupid. Yeah. It was never because you no. didn't know. No, yeah. It was because you didn't have the opportunity. Lack of opportunity. It was lack of opportunity. And I was able to prove to myself and that built my confidence so much and continues to. And I strive to be a really good student because, and like 4.0 at this point now, like if I get a B in one of my classes right now, like it is what it is. I'm giving my very best effort. Mm-hmm. Would I still love that streak? Yes. And I'm still <laughs> trying, but I'm not going to lose epic amounts of sleep over it. Like I did my associate's degree that was like, maintain it, hold on. Um, But that was such a gift to me. But one of the things that just blew me away when I was taking an astronomy class and I remember thinking, this is why they didn't want me to go to school. Yeah. (laughs) Because if I took this this class in high school, I would have been like, y'all are crazy. This is bullshit. (laughs) Like this is insane that you could think that the earth is this young and that God is that small, that he would be so concerned about our tiny little lives. Like it's just like the Oh, the universe is so vast and infinite. And like what you were saying about um, about like there being a God, a deity or whatever, you know, I feel like we're all just trying to make sense of the world yeah. as human beings. We have to, we sometimes just have to put a name to something that we can just understand with our little tiny yeah, minds sure. with something so vast. So like making it a single <laughs> or, you know, like um, a single origin source, like God, it's like, Yes, of course. Our minds can only comprehend so much because look at the universe. Like, yeah. We don't even know. There's so much we don't and even so know. so much that I was saying to Zach over the last couple of podcasts is like something that I've thought about a lot that it, it would make sense that religion and like this idea of communal religion would be such an evolutionary part of humanity to, for survival, mm-hmm. right? Because if everyone's working and believing the same thing and supporting one another, then like food and surviving becomes yeah. a joint effort. And it can be really beautiful it can if be, done yeah, well. It makes sense where like food was the number one thing we needed to focus on forever as human beings mm-hmm. that if we had like, it feels so evolutionary and where now it feels like against evolution, Right. We're changing. We've like evolved mm-hmm. more. Like we have the internet. Mm-hmm. We have more awareness, more Power. curiosity and all these things. It's funny that you bring up the stars because that really was when I was sneaking out of my parents' house, going to smoke weed at the park with my friend. And he would stand up and be like, so here's the something else I learned about dude space. And I'd be like, oh, my God. <laughs> like the star, looking up at the stars really were like a freedom of mine. So like I was telling you earlier, like Star Wars as a kid took me over because uh-huh. it was like – Faith isn't like whatever faith is faith, but force is like the force is like this fake thing that uh-huh. makes like these endless galaxies and all these planets and different like beliefs and religions and like in this planet. Or so, yeah, so I like that because wow. the st- stars saved me too. Mm, they really amazing. did. It, it really just made me be more in awe of everything around me. If anything, you know, yeah, like yeah. just. Uh, how could it, how could you possibly live a limited and narrow view when you yeah. understand, when you start to even look and understand and ask questions about that? It's just it's infinite. Infinite. So, yes. It is. Just like this podcast. We're talking mm. forever. It is. It's in, we could just <laughs> keep talk going forever. and going that's actually, and going. That, that's actually like a big part of this cast is like, we don't have that big of a reach. And so it can kind of feel like, oh, we're uploading these really heartfelt things to who? Huh? Um but really, it's like we're uploading these things for eternity, our message. It's like it's going on the internet. I mean, unless It'll be there. It'll unless be there. The, the all power eye keep, of YouTube yeah. takes it down. <laughs> they keep, you know, shadow banning yeah. us and flagging us for mm-hmm. politics and mm-hmm. blah, 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 yeah. blah, blah. And hopefully yeah. we don't get to that point where yeah. that would happen. But it does feel like nice to just be able to be putting like vulnerable messages on the internet of truth. Yeah. And just there forever. Yeah. And I'm excited for it to, you know, with every new person you have on, there's a whole other like community of reach and uh, oh, you know totally. people to reach, right? So I'm so excited. There's been several of my friends recently who are like, please send me the link once it's ready. Like I want to oh listen. Yeah. I want to listen and I'll share it and I'm here for it. I'm to support you. Well, we've had SDA. We've had Southern Baptist twice now. We've mm-hmm. had a, a man out of Southern Baptist, the South, and then a woman, Southern Baptist, mm-hmm. Evangelical, which so many similarities to yeah, Calvary Chapel. Yeah, Southern Baptist for sure. And yeah. then to Calvary Chapel, like from home. So that's mm-hmm. been like our nervous, really nervous for us to do this, yeah. but like powerful. So I feel like we've made a milestone to all of us. Yeah. Thank you yeah. so much, Julian. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> um, but, um, and then we've had a gentleman um, from SDA, you know, Seventh Day of yeah, Venice, which right. blew our minds. Yeah. yeah. Totally different. The focus contrast. on education yes. and Huge like. Huge focus on professional education. Professional mm-hmm. education and perfectionism. So it's just di- like, there's yeah. so many different levels so to many. this. 
Just scratching the surface here. Yeah. yeah. I love it. I think that there is a generalized connection in the Christian in, in this sort of evangelical or just Christianity that's like lack of self I've come to make is like a lot of us born in a religious one way or the high where this is what it is. This is the answer is there's like an extreme lack of curiosity of anything else, fear of anything else. And then yourself is like non-existent until hopefully, right, you f- discover that. And the scariest thing ever is to be like, all right, I'm gonna go deeper into myself. It's so scary. Um, one of the questions, or what I'm gonna ask, and then Zach's gonna ask his famous question, and then we'll okay. we'll call it okay. okay. <laughs> is do you want to share your new the new public social media account that you're gonna be like sharing your because you're starting this conversation on mm-hmm. your own? Yeah. What are, where yeah. can we find that? Um, it is my handle on the social media. I'm on TikTok a little, like I'm sharing kind of simultaneously. Um, the handle is the same on both Instagram and TikTok. It's it's Julia Myers, I T S J U L I A M Y E R S. Sometimes Myers is spelled different, but it's mm. why. So uh that is where I am. And I am welcome to connect with people if they want to DM me, if they, you know, like we can chat. Um, if people are angry about this and want to chat, I also welcome that as long as <laughs> they are respectful and stay curious instead if they just want to come in and preach i'm like wow. i'll say no thank you yeah um but if someone wants to say i don't understand this can you explain i'm curious like i yeah. don't understand because i'm in or whatever i'm willing to have those conversations because i think there's i think that nobody is beyond a place where they can learn more and grow and totally. myself included so i can learn from others mm-hmm. others can learn from me we can learn together but if the posture is i'm gonna judge you please don't dm me yeah. If you do, I'll just ignore it. Yeah. Um, if it's like totally. that, but if it's curious, I'm I'm here for it, and I really I love to communicate and connect with people. So mm, very cool. Yeah, and on that, I'll share about you know religious trauma. I'm also going to start sharing a little bit more about how working out and moving my body has totally. been really critical to my healing journey. So there's going to be a little bit of that sprinkled in there too, because um, I think it's really important. You know, like connecting with our emotions yeah. and our physical body as well. So I feel like a lot of this cast we talked a l- like. Most of this was being like, here's an example of why religious drama is tr- like real. Mm-hmm. If you don't think like, because a lot of, I know like people from this Calvary Chapel that we grew up in and in our own families, they're like, religious trauma is a non-existent thing. It's not real. And I feel like this podcast is, you could watch this and be like, oh yeah, it's fucking real. <laughs> like your life is living proof. I know Zach and I have talked hours about mm-hmm. hours, but I feel like you really like encapsulated such in a religious traumatic experience in your life from like birth to mm-hmm. all the way into marriage, yeah. you know? It's fascinating yeah. to see where you're at now and I'm so happy for you. And um, just, to, yeah. just to piggyback yeah. off that, it's also uh, so difficult to tell the people that traumatized you how you were traumatized by them because they love to tell you that your trauma is not real and that hurts, pulls me outside of myself. Really traumatizing. The spirit yeah. we're talking about, like- I can't even feel it anymore at that point. So I don't even know what logic means. And I'm like, I can't express anything anymore. So to actually like tell our parents, like multiple times I've had conversations with them about this trauma. And they're like, just t- explain it to us. And I'm like, I don't even know who you are anymore. Yeah. Like, I just can't even think, yeah. you know, but. Sometimes it's not what I've learned as well. I, I know we're kind of concluding one of the things I've learned as well is sometimes there are certain relationships where it simply cannot be us. Yeah, it can't mm. be. That nope. it simply cannot yeah, be us. We're not totally. going to be the ones to help those people along because they were the ones. And this isn't true for everyone. Sometimes people can heal and repair and recover relationships. And that if that's true for someone, then that's wonderful. Sometimes, though, it's just not possible because of the way in which trauma, like re-traumatization is going to take place or the level at which the trauma was, how long it they endured it for, how it like never stopped, it just changed or whatever. Sometimes people have to go completely no contact. That's been my experience the last few years with my remaining parent, unfortunately. Um, mm. I And that's just been the only way that I could heal. Mm. It was really, truly the only way that I could heal. Wow. Is it going to be that way forever? I don't know. But it is has been still the right decision for me. But one of the things I get like kind of heartbroken sometimes, like I need to save all these other people. I need to get them. Like, yeah. you know, yeah. like sometimes it can't be us. Which is crazy. You said saved. Too. It's so real, yeah. right? I mean, like save, right? But like, but yeah. That real. God complex yeah. is built into us. Right, in right. Way. And I mean, like, and, and maybe, yeah, and, and save, like maybe like a little like, Freudian slip or whatever they call it. No, but, I like, think that's yeah. very much what it is. It's like, I think that we were conditioned to be trying to save the world. Yeah, and then right. when you come out of it, you're like, oh my God, I need to like... 
there's a lot of people lost. Yeah, they've got to know. <laughs> they got to know the truth. <laughs> yeah. yeah, but sometimes they can't hear it from us. We're right. too close. The proximity is too close. And so sometimes it just means we have to look at that relationship and go, I appreciate your curiosity. I appreciate that you want to know. I can't be the one to break it down for you. Boundaries. Because I cannot re-enter my body, my emotions back into that space. Please, though, go and do the work yeah. and go to therapy. Go ask ask those people. questions. And I promise you, you will find that information that you need. Yeah. And then we can talk about it once you've done that work. Because not only did you cause the trauma, I shouldn't have to break it Dude, down right back to no, you. Yeah. <laughs> I'm like taking advice from this right now yeah. with our parents, just with how um, this podcast is like caused a lot of like real like desire for a relationship but like we are in a very different place and yeah. they're being confronted with it and it's kind of like go do the work yes and learn and i guarantee you will be able You'll to understand. really have better conversations mm -hmm. if you like actually care enough to like think outside of or how it's possible you know but don't make me do the work for you we've been doing it for them their whole lives but boundaries are so hard. Boundaries are so powerful. It can really, yeah. Um, all right. We got to really wrap this up because Do I got to pee. have to? I know, but Zach, <laughs> Zach, ask your famous question. All right. Okay. <laughs> Uh, a big motivator for me, I know for Nate too, but to do this podcast is that there's kids right now in an evangelical family with no choice, right? Mm, in the same I'm already going to cry. <laughs> in the same situation you were in, the same situation I was in, we can feel it. Even when I ask this question, I am always like back in my younger self, like, hopeless, helpless, and lost in it and believing it 100%. What would be any advice if, I, and I focus on the children, but we'll just broad spectrum, anyone else that's like battling with their faith or has pulled away and is struggling with their religious trauma now, what would be your advice for them to heal? And, and what, what should they be doing? Oh, man. <laughs> <laughs> Do people cry at this part? Oh God, yeah, yeah. No, but someone that really cares about people's healing might. I am. <laughs> uh, well, there's tissues just, right there <laughs> if you are going to cry. <laughs> I am crying. Thank you. I just like, I can't help but picture like simultaneous images at the same time as like us as little kids. Like yeah. I imagine us out on your little playground outside your house in Pengrove, like running around and oh doing God, our right? little things. Like, yeah. you know, I just remember little us and so as a little. parent looking at my little kids and I think to myself, like, what would I say? <laughs> like, well, yeah. What would you say I to would yourself? Just, I would, I just, I think that I would want to just hold her and tell her that she's good <laughs> and that the people around her are really hurting and they don't know what they're doing. And that she can trust herself. And she's always been able to trust herself from the beginning. And that's always been true and it'll always be true. And that that is all that you have every day. You just have yourself. And so you need to honor that and trust that. And don't ever let anyone take it away from you. Mm. I, I wish I could tell all of us that. That's <laughs> beautiful. Well, I think we are telling ourselves yeah. that. Like, yeah. Now we're doing it on sort of a level that we were trained to do it. We were yeah. trained to be activists. We were trained to go out there and try to save lives from this evil earth. And now here we are like, you know, using a platform to uh, preach what we really believe is true for ourselves. That was really beautiful. Very powerful. Thank you for saying that. Yeah, thank you. So until next time. Yeah, yeah. there'll definitely be well, a next yeah, time. So we I, barely scratched the, the surface. One of the things I was going to, it sounds like you are in contact with a lot of people that are from the past or from different churches or religious. Yeah. And I would just ask that if you ever meet somebody that wants to go public, because I know you're going to have your own platform. We'd love to be on it someday in your future. Absolutely love that. Please send them our way. Yes. Um, we would love to, I think, at, maybe not now, but at some point, we've talked about this, that like when we're more open to interviewing like more religious people, I'd love to have your husband on. Oh my gosh. We yeah. really want to use our platform right now for this, like all ego aside us, the people, the kids totally. that were like gone through what we've been through to finally have like an experience to be able to go public about it is yeah. so powerful. Yeah, yeah, I agree. And so, um, because yeah. those that do get hugely ostracized as we've seen. Yeah. It can be kind of brutal. Yeah. yeah. I, I love that. And I love that that space is the, the, point like that 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 is what this is for yeah because yeah. that is so neat storytelling and it's and it's a reclaiming of your 
mm-hmm. agency and your autonomy in totally. it, right? Like, and so that's powerful, and there should be a place for that. Totally. Um, without fear that someone else is going to come in and go, well, it should be this, and well, that was just one church that hurt you. Yeah. Know, like, yeah. I mean, and I can guarantee that would never be <laughs> the yeah. message you did from my husband. <laughs> right, like, right, right. Things would not be the way they are if that was yeah. the message you took. No. Um, but yeah, I know that he'd be open to that eventually, but I absolutely will keep that in mind for people who, I mean, I talk to people daily, literally, like my dear. <laughs> My DMs are crazy. I'm crazy. They're literally like I have like dozens and dozens of ongoing messages every day. And when I post stuff, it's like more and more and more. And I'm like, oh my gosh, this could be like a part-time job. I don't know how to, like, it's a lot to manage, but I love it. I love it because it's too much for us. You know, it's (laughs) like, it's just, it's good. It's good work. Yeah. Yeah. So anybody that you would imagine that would like, would benefit from this or would love to share their story. Um, like we were raised in the church to listen to people's testimonials every Sunday, right? Where it was like, here's another drug addict or another person from prison to share their crazy life and how they healed. We really believe in people's testimonies of the religious trauma and then coming out of that church, right? Those yep. story, like everybody's yep. story, just like there in church mattered. They matter so much now. Yep. Um, these discoveries of self are just powerful as fuck. And I know that they ripple through so much more than just religious trauma because kn- there's a lot of people that have hit me up I don't say a lot, but handfuls that aren't religious mm-hmm. that have started following our podcast mainly just because they've never really seen people talk this way. Mm-hmm. You know? And I found that fast, like more yeah. less about content, more about context. Mm-hmm. So these conversations matter. Yeah, totally. they sure do. You know? It's just real. And so yeah. I really appreciate you. I love you. And um, I'm so happy your kids are doing well mm. and that they love themselves. <laughs> um, um, yeah. Yeah. We'd love to have you back you on. We do a lot of um, uh, one of our segments. We call it a moment to Reddit. And it's where we get like Reddit posts from ex-Christian mm-hmm. or ex-whatever. And we just find like hot and heated posts of like yeah. anonymous people. And then we like read Comment them. And, yeah, and we just have com- yeah, yeah, we'd love to have you back on for that. <laughs> oh, I'd be totally here for it. It would just yeah. be like we'd all talk about these comments. Love it. You know, stuff like love that. It. I'd be so. totally here for it. Cool. Totally down. Cool. Yeah. Love this. Well, thanks guys. for being here. Thank you, everybody. Um, that's a wrap. This might be our longest podcast yet, <laughs> right? Yeah. Part one, part two. Yeah. I don't know. Split no, it up. this is like gold. <laughs> yeah, this is great. Yeah. Right. No, yeah. Love it. So, great. All right, all right everybody. Thanks, Julia. Thanks for being here. Mm-hmm. Yeah, thank you, Julia. All right, everybody. Bye, thanks. everyone. See you next time. Bye.